about this um, under our agenda item for next agenda items. Um, but that would be the way that I would imagine um, imagine um, exercising the authority for that function. Ms. Yara. So it, so it sounds like it would be exercising at this point would be the kind of exploratory to find out like what what our options are. Yes. For us and so that we'll have more information to work from. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yes, that, that is not a decision that I would want to make on behalf of the board. Um, I think I think that that is, um, as you alluded to, it is an important and, and big decision. It affects a number of things. Ms. De La Torre? Yes, just to summarize, because we you know, share different ideas. So th then, um, am I understanding correctly, correctly that then the idea will be to leave it as is and then this delegation shall expire, will change to, we will review this delegation in every board meeting and it will be an agenda item. Is that what we are agreeing on? I'm just a little confused as to where we are on that. Thank you. Well, I think the discussion has had a, a couple, three different options um, within it. Um, one would be to leave it the way that it is with the understanding that we, it can be rescinded at any time and we will revisit certainly when we hire an executive director. Um, another option would be to change it um, so that there's a triggering function um, that uh, was, it was the authority would move or be rescinded and move to the executive director. I think that after discussion, there was a little bit less support for that. Um, and then another option that I mentioned at the top of the discussion would be for the delegation um, for rather than it saying that it would expire one year to simply say that we would have to revisit it and the board would need to extend it um, at every meeting. So I think those are the options that I heard discussed um, and I would welcome um, input from anybody who, if I'm missing anything. It seems that Perhaps renewing it every meeting will make sense if there is going to be some reporting involved, and it has to be in the agenda for us to discuss it anyway, right? Because if it's not in the agenda, we couldn't even discuss it. Is, is that correct? That's correct. Um, and I believe at least the comments that I heard from Ms. Sierra and Mr. Thompson would, were that that would be a fine option for them. I have not yet heard from Mr. Lay, um, who may or may not have comments. Um, while we wait to see if he does, I would like to ask Mr. Laird um, if he could help um, help us draft that. I apologize, sorry. Help us draft uh, the, if, if, the if revised we, delegation to reflect the... If we choose that the delegation basically lasts from meeting to meeting mm -hmm. and the board needs to revisit it um, after hearing my report in each mm -hmm. meeting. Um, uh, we would need to change this highlighted language here. And yes. I was just hoping for some on the fly. Oh yes, of <laughs> course, of course. Um, uh, yes, I, I, think, um, I think we would just revise it to say uh, uh, the delegation shall expire um, Let's see, upon the next um, noticed regular meeting of the board, um, I think we could just leave it at that, in fact. Um, and then it would be a new delegation adopted each time uh, if that were the format we were to take. Um, yeah. I suppose we could also say the delegation shall remain in effect until the following notice board meeting or something at which point the board can choose to extend it? Yes, uh, I should mention too, I, I mean, I think we can also, depending on which direction the board wants to go today, um, if you wanna direct the delegation to be renewed every meeting, um, I, I don't, I will say, I think we could probably button down language that reflects that um, after the meeting, after the delegation is adopted. Although I know, I understand we're trying to delegate or we're trying to adopt a pretty specific language here, but we could um, sort of make as part of the motion that the um, 
uh, delegation is until the next regular board meeting, unless uh, further extended or something to that effect, and which would then require its readoption at the following meeting. I guess my point is we could also reflect in the motion sort of how long this delegation will last and then uh, memorialize that afterwards in this document. All right. I am comfortable with either option. In my view, it's really up to the board. Um, I, I feel um, I like the idea of having Mr. Laird have a chance to make sure the language, he feels like the language is exactly right. Um, but I also understand if the board would like um, us to, to go ahead and, and um, have the language reflected now. Um, so I would uh, ask for comments on that, Mr. Thompson. My only comment is if we're gonna go board meeting to meeting, um, should, if the executive director is hired in between meetings, should the, this delegation extend to that person in that intervening time? Um, I think that would be procedurally difficult, um, except that it is possible, let's see, this delegation may allow me to go ahead and delegate things to the executive director for that two weeks or three weeks or whatever it is. Um, Mr. Lair, could you give us some advice on this? I, I suppose I'm thinking right now that um, I, I believe the intent of the board at this point, based on earlier discussion, is to um, appoint an executive director at a regularly held meeting. And my point being, uh, so I would suppose the timing could be such that, you know, should we be at a meeting where we anticipate hiring an executive director, we could also agendize transfer at the delegation at that meeting as well, instead of an ongoing um, Sure. delegation to the chair. Um, but I, I think we could also, um, again, it, it's sort of however we want to um, control the delegation. Uh, again, there can be that automatic trigger function too in the interim. And, and to the chair's point, it's interesting. Um, I suppose there is an argument to be made that you could delegate then just directly to the executive director in the interim. Um, but uh, again, I, I would probably recommend always to be a little, to be on the conservative side, at least, um, you know, perhaps having the full board make that delegation is, is the most prudent route. Thank you. I actually thought better of that procedurally because this delegation does not give the chair the authority to appoint the executive director. The executive director cannot be point appointed except when the board appoints the executive director, at which point in that meeting, presumably the board would choose to um, delegate whatever authority the board considers to be appropriate on the executive director. If that makes sense. I don't think there is a situation um, where we actually would end up with um, the interim interim executive director. Um, I suppose there is the possibility that we'd make an offer and then we would have to wait. Um, is that what you were thinking? Uh, that's about? what I was thinking is, yeah. you know, we authorize the hire, but then right. somebody has to make the offer, the offer has to be accepted. We won't be there for that. I guess we could delegate the authority at the time of the offer, but we don't know that it'll be accepted. So that, that was my thinking. I don't feel strongly about this. I feels to me like going meeting to meeting is a little restrictive, um, but that's just me. Right, okay. Um, well, we can't, I mean, because we have to meet publicly to, to make new decisions, I feel comfortable with that. Um, I, 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 I feel as though that would, allow me to help the staff do what they need to do. Um, if Mr. Laird agrees, um, then I know that I feel comfortable with that. Um, and Mr. 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 Lay, um, did you have a comment? No, <clears throat> I just wanted to go for whatever solution allows for yeah, the most flexibility. So um, yeah, not, not really, don't feel very strongly about this. Thank you, Mr. Lay, I appreciate that. All right. Um, thank you, um, everyone, for the comments and thoughts. Um, my initial proposal is to um, suggest that we do, as Mr. Laird suggested, um, and to add to the motion um, that this delegation of authority um, is accepted as, um, as it will be revised um, to allow for the delegation of authority to extend between board meetings um, and for the board to discuss and revisit it at each board meeting. I would like to ask if there is public comment. Thank you, Chairperson. 
Uh, so if there's anyone who wishes to make a public comment at this time, please press the raised hand icon in your meeting window. Or if you're connected by telephone, you may press star nine. And I'm not seeing any comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. Are there further comments or um, questions from the board? In that case, um, may I have a motion to accept this delegation of authority as amended according to our discussion today so that the delegation of authority to the chair extends only until our next board meeting and then must be discussed and renewed? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Do I have a second? I second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. Joseph Panero, will you please take the roll call vote? Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, so Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Ms. De La Torre, aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Mr. Lay, aye. Ms. Uh, Ms. Sierra? Aye. Ms. Sierra, aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Thompson, aye. And Chairperson aye. Urban? The motion has been approved of a vote of five. Uh, yes, a zero no, and no abstentions. Thank you very much to everyone. I am now going to try to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> um, give me one second. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, we will now move on to agenda item number eight, uh, which is our next discussion of board and agency policies and practices, um, our conflict of interest code, which is required um, by law for us to have. I should note there are a series of policies that we will eventually need for this meeting. Um, we are considering what staff helped me identify as the policies we need um, at this moment. The uh, conflict of interest code is one of those and Deputy General Counsel Laird will be presenting this to us for discussion. Mr. Laird. Yes, thank you. And uh, this will be my last formal presentation. So I'll keep this one quick. Uh, um, and I don't have a PowerPoint for this one because it is relatively straightforward. Um, as the chair mentioned, uh, the government code does require all state entities to uh, adopt a conflict of interest code. And for agencies being new, newly created like your own, there is um, a six month deadline to get that ball rolling on that. Um, your authority to adopt this conflict of interest code is actually comes from uh, that body of law as opposed to what appears in Proposition 24. So. Uh, just understanding the conflict of interest code is a regulation you're adopting. Um, however, it's done uh, sort of in tandem with the Fair Political Practices Commission. It's a, it's a slightly different process in that regard where they also actually will notice the uh, proposed conflict of interest code on their end as well. Um, but these, generally speaking, are very identical from one code to another. So what you see in your package today is a draft that has been um, uh, reviewed and pre-approved by the Fair Political Practices Commission. Um, we did our best to reflect the positions we think we know will exist. Um, uh, obviously though, as the agency grows and develops, this code will have to be amended and that's a regular process. In fact, there's a process the FPPC requires where every two years you basically check in on whether or not you need to amend your conflict of interest code to better reflect the makeup and responsibilities of your agency. So um, the code today that we've um, uh, uh, included in your packages, uh, again, most of the language appearing there is, is, I don't wanna call it boilerplate, but it's common between conflicts of interest code. Um, and then the um, uh, categories of, of, of people needing to report, and this is your form 700, this is who needs to uh, disclose uh, certain economic interests um, or uh, other, other property interests uh, within the state of California uh, would include obviously you, the board members, the executive director when that uh, position is appointed, uh, the chief privacy auditor, um, as well as then we've included this uh, deputy director of administration that's been um, uh, discussed at, at some length today, uh, attorney all levels, because we know for a fact that there will have to be a, a pretty robust legal staff for this agency. And then um, finally, this is common to all conflict of interest codes too, though, and that is consultants in new positions. 
And so that's sort of that backstop for the situation where maybe a position is created and hired before we're able to uh, amend the conflict of interest code under these parameters, they would then still report their economic interests um, as a new position um, until their position gets a more specific disclosure category. Um, the other thing I should just mention is the disclosure category for pretty much everyone except the administration position um, is the uh, broadest disclosure category, the most um, sort of open transparency that, that, that the FPPC kind of measures it out in terms of uh, in discussing it, at least with them. Uh, I think there was some consensus that that felt appropriate for this entity who in many regards um, regulates virtually every business and type of business uh, potentially in the state by virtue of the information they collect on individuals. And so as a result, it seemed uh, that this would be the best way to uh, ensure proper reporting that adequately uh, reflects sort of uh, uh, potential conflicts and, and ultimately helps avoid them for, for situations moving forward. So um, the where we are in the process is that uh, today your vote would be to uh, uh, vote to send this out for public comment. Um, and again, it's like the process I said, uh, mentioned to you before, where then it would be, uh, there would be a 45 day public comment period. Um, I will just say, uh, rarely have I seen the public comment on, on these conflicts of interest code, but of course they are welcome to if they would like to, or if they uh, uh, have any comments they'd like to share about what's being proposed. Um, and then uh, we'd bring this back to you for final adoption and approval before it would become permanent. So this is really just kicking off the process and helping us meet that six month deadline. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Thank you. Is there any public comment, Mr. Joseph Panera? Thank you, Chairperson. So if anyone, uh, any member of the public wants to make a comment, please raise your hand at this time or press star nine on your telephone. And give a couple of moments. I am not seeing uh, any comments. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Panero. I will pause one more moment in case there are comments or questions from the board. All right, may I have a motion to approve the a conflict of interest code to go out for comment. Is that correct, Mr. Lewis? Yes, that's correct. May I have a motion to approve the conflict of interest code to be disseminated for public comment? I so move. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. May I have a second? Second. I second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. Joseph Panera, will you please um, conduct the roll call vote? Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Ms. De La Torre, aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Mr. Lay, aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Ms. Sierra, aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Thompson, aye. And Chairperson Urban? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Panero. The conflict of interest code um, being sent out for public comment has been approved by a vote of five yes to zero no with no abstentions. Thank you very much to all the members of the board. Moving on to agenda item number nine, uh, board and agency policies and practices um, item two. Oh, I apologize. I do see a hand um, up for public comment. Mr. Joseph Panero, did we, did we miss somebody? I believe that hand came up uh, either as the vote was taken or after. Okay. Uh, if you'd like to take that comment now, we can do so or we can hold. Um, why don't we um, hold for the next round of public comment? So I'll Certainly, Chairperson. A citizen in advance for it. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, agenda item number nine: um, board agencies policies and practices. Excuse me. Board and agency policies and practices. The board member handbook. We now turn to um, considering the um, draft initial California Privacy Protection Agency board member handbook, I would like to ask board members to please turn your attention to the agenda item nine materials in your meeting packet, um, which, is a just, which is a draft um, handbook. Uh, this is a basic draft. It sets out some key legal requirements, um, uh, useful to know information for the board, uh, like required paperwork and information about the per diem um, and standard board policies. 
The expectation is that we will re revise this over time as needed. For example, we will eventually need to add other legally required policies and trainings to the lists on pages three and four. There are often policies with regards to travel and expenditures um, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but um, these handbooks, as I understand it, are regularly revised um, and, and this is a starting point. A lot of this is, um, is very, in fact, all of it is, um, I will be frank and say all of it has been pulled from other handbooks. Um, so um, it is quite standard. Again, I don't want to use the word um, boilerplate, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that we might want to discuss. Um, one of the um, areas that um, I thought the board might like to discuss, for example, um, is the communications um, section of the handbook. Uh, there are a variety of ways to do this um, particular um, policy. Some boards are more restrictive. Um, uh, my plan um, for this section of the handbook uh, was to not restrict board members from um, speaking to stakeholders, for example, um, or uh, speaking um, on panels um, uh, 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 with their, their own ideas and that kind of thing, and simply um, making sure that we all understand that no individual person um, should be speaking for the board. Um, and then separately as a practical matter, um, routing media communications um, through the executive director um, and or through me, given that we don't have an executive director yet, so that we have um, we have an organized um, record of media communication. So that's the basic idea behind that section. Um, I don't know if there were other any other sections that people noticed, but of course it's all open for discussion. Um, and with that, um, I would like to ask if the board has comments or questions on the handbook um, discussion they would like to have about it. Mr. Lay. Yeah, I, I have a question about, you know, when it says the board shall not, uh, you know, you're not speaking on behalf of the board. Um, when does it turn into you speaking on behalf of the board? Like, can you be identified as a board member on a, on a, on a panel or something, or is it better just to use your private affiliation? Yeah. I think that's a great question. Um, I am, I, one thing that we could think about for future iterations of this handbook would be more uh, granular guidance on that. Um, my feeling about it is that if the topic under discussion is something that is under the board's purview, um, then it is important to follow the policy um, uh, sort of at the bottom of the communication section that says that you should be sure um, to, ident to um, basically have a disclaimer that you are not speaking on behalf of the board, that, you're, um, that what you are saying is simply your own position. As many, um, as, as I'm, probably all of you have done um, with regards to um, your law firm, or in my case, my university, um, to be clear with the audience that you're not speaking on behalf of the board. I would also say that there is the possibility here as well um, for board members to be designated to speak on behalf of the board um, on certain topics. I can imagine that eventually down the road, um, there might be something for which um, a board member is speaking on behalf of the board. And um, it would just be a matter of making sure that those items are clearly identified. Ms. De La Torre? Yes, thank you. Um, so I am in agreement with what was mentioned by the um, chairwoman and by Mr. Lee in terms of, of course, the board is not every individual member and we shouldn't speak on behalf of the board. But I'm not, um, I'm not sure that the language reflects only that. In particular, in page eight, I was, well, one initial thought on this manual it will have been helpful to have it in advance of the meeting, not as of Thursday last week, but maybe a few more days so that it gives time for all of us to kind of absorb the information, um, at least for me. Um, but to the conversation that we were having, um, on page A where it says board member written correspondent 
correspondence and mailings, it states a board member must not produce correspondence, press releases, articles, memoranda, or any other communication made in the board member's official capacity. And I think that that's what we agree with, but it continues to say, or regarding matters under the jurisdiction or responsibility of the board. So even if it's not in my official capacity as the board, I cannot make any comment regarding any of the um, aspects that are under the jurisdiction or responsibility of the board, unless designated to speak on a specific issue by the chairperson. Maybe it's a drafting issue, but it seems to go way beyond the idea of not speaking on behalf of the board. I'm concerned even if I were to write a paper on a topic that has to do with privacy, whether this language will require me to obtain prior authorization to, to just release a paper, which I'm sure was not the intended um, goal of the drafting, but it seems that the language takes us there. Thank you very much, Delatore. I very much appreciate you pointing that out. And I agree with you. I think, I think that whenever this language was drafted initially, um, it's, I think the idea was the combination of the official capacity and um, official correspondence, you know, that is on like the board's letterhead and that kind of, I think that was the idea, but you're correct, it doesn't say that. And one thing we could consider would simply be to remove that a subordinate clause or regarding, regarding matters under the jurisdiction or responsibility of the board. Um, I certainly um, would not want the board to not be able to write papers on, you know, the topic of privacy, um, for example. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I had a similar reaction that uh, Ms. Delatore had. Um, could you clarify, just so that I don't want to retread ground, what, it, what were you proposing to strike? Um, on page eight, and Ms. Delatore, please um, let me know if I have this wrong. On page eight, um, under board member written communicate correspondence and mailings, mm -hmm. line, lines two and three, comma, or regarding matters under the jurisdiction or responsibility of the board. I believe Ms. Delatore's point was that that clause took this um, provision away from just official board mm -hmm. members' official capacity and um, unintentionally expanded it um, to anything that is basically what we what is under our jurisdiction, if that makes sense. It does. Um, I would I would propose maybe going a little bit further than that because there's 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 a few places within this handbook where it could be interpreted to mean that board members shouldn't inter engage or be accessible to members of the public or interested stakeholders. I think we should be careful about getting rid of those because I think, you know, as a policymaking body, we, we should be accessible to people who have views on these issues. Um, and I don't know how others feel. I, I feel like there's a difference between any individual board member expressing a view as a board member, one of five, and expressing a view representing that they're representing the board. That's a different matter. Um, you know, should a board member be able to say, I think this, I think this about this issue or write an op-ed about an issue? Um, not saying that they're speaking on behalf of the board, speaking on behalf of themselves as a policymaker in this area. That strikes me as appropriate, uh, as long as one is not representing that, that, that one is speaking for the board as a body, but is speaking as a member of the board. Uh, I think that's an important distinction, but I, I would, it, it, I think it diminishes our ability to engage in a policy dialogue if we can't voice our opinions, express our views in various fora, in various media uh, about what we think. So I, I would want to go through this and, and strike out some of those or, or replace them so that we are engaging in the public policy debate and are accessible to folks. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Delatory, 
I realized that I went to Mr. Thompson before checking with you after I. No, it's okay. I, I, in general, I really feel like I will need a little bit more time to kind of, you know, go through the um, different sections. One question that I had, and I don't know if um, the chairman has an answer. Some of the sections cite to specific authority. Does that mean that those sections are recitations of the law, meaning there is no other option? We're just reciting the law to create a record for us to remember that we need to abide for, by, by, by those provisions? Or is it a situation where the law might offer options and we just chose one of the various options um, that are available? Do we, do we know an answer to that? So um, I, um, I would want to um, ask Mr. Laird to be sure for each one, but most of them are, I would say, as of a paraphrasing of something that is in the law, in the government code or in the um, CCPA, for example. However, um, there are at least, there's at least one um, that is a hybrid on page six under agency administration. Um, the executive director, chief privacy auditor, um, those items, um, those, uh, what the manual says, or the handbook um, draft says there is reflecting the cited civil code, which are the relevant sections of the uh, California Consumer Privacy Act as amended by the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020. But they also encompass um, things that are more in line with board policy. Um, so for example, the executive director is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations and integrity of the agency. Um, that part is not directly um, in, the, in the civil code. Um, so most of those parentheticals um, are, you know, you must avoid conflicts of interest and that's reflecting the relevant law. Um, but I am aware of this one, at least that is more of a melding. Um, and one thing we could do would be to go through carefully and be sure that we say, for example, we could say civil code section 1798.199.30 um, uh, semicolon board policy um, within that parent parenthetical. Um, so that's one way that we could handle that if it would help to identify, um, be sure that it, it's clear what's board policy versus what is the law. That, that would be one way to more clearly identify those. And, and I'm not saying that we need to identify that in policies, yes, in, in the documents, just that when I was reviewing it, I was wondering. Um, on that section where it talks about agency staff, I think um, the third line, the executive director hired by the board is an exempt position. I think we neglect to include the um, auditor as well there because that would be an exempt position. It seems that it was an oversight perhaps that it was not included there. And then the, the last question that I have is in page four where it talks about the responsibilities of the chairperson. Is this a separate delegation to the chairperson, that section, um, in addition to the two delegations that we did already? Oh, no. That, well, at least that isn't what I, what I thought. But um, Mr. Laird, it, could that be interpreted that way? Of the... it, it, to, to the extent um, anybody feels that what's represented in that section um, uh, provides uh, any sort of authority that um, isn't already incumbent on the chair position. Um, this could operate as a delegation, uh, the adoption of this manual, um, but it, it, it really comes down to uh, if anything in there specifically is um, not within the purview of the chair already without uh, this provision being adopted. Thank you, Ms. Laird. Ms. De La Torre, did you have a follow-up Right. I just want to make sure I understand. So what we're saying is that it is a delegation, but we might already have delegated. So it's it's not an additional delegation if it was already delegated. Is that what we're saying, Mrs. Mr. Blair? Uh, that's correct. And, and I will also say, as I'm browsing through some of these just now, I, I, I will acknowledge too, I think a lot of these are um, what are commonly uh, the functions of a board chair across the boards uh, we oversee in other contexts. It, it, um, to uh, uh, the chair's point, um, this was drawn largely from other handbooks of other boards. And, and this is traditionally, I think, how, how the state sees boards operates and, and the function of the chair and sort of assisting with coordinating meetings and all. 
Thank you, Mr. Laird. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Um, to the thank you, Chairperson Urban. Uh, to the point about the delegation, I read it as an additional delegation as well, particularly the section on uh, forming subcommittees reads as a unilateral authority, um, which is not in encompassed in the delegation that we discussed previously. Um, perhaps we should amend that to read propose subcommittees or form subcommittees with the concurrence of the board. Because uh, I read that as unilateral. And I don't know if that was the intention. Um, that was my understanding as the usual practice. Um, so it was was the intention so far as practice goes. Again, I do apologize. I wasn't actually thinking um, about this as as a as an official delegation, which is which is my which is my fault. But that is my understanding of the usual practice. I would prefer that we have concurrence on the formation and assignment of, of folks to to subcommittees rather than that being a unilateral authority of the chairperson. I don't know how I would feel that that seemed given that, that we're figuring each other out and this is all new. Um, you know, if we're going to form subcommittees, I'd like to have some say in what they are, what their scope is, who's on them. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. We should break, take that up under the subcommittee agenda item. Um, but that um, the point that is relevant to the um, to the language in the board manual um, is is noted and, and thank you for that. Ms. De La Torre. Um, I have an additional question since um, this is a uh, delegation. Will it be correct to read this delegation as an exclusive delegation, meaning those things that if we were to decide to delegate them to the chairperson will be exclusively delegated to the chairperson, meaning it takes the power away from the board to delegate on somebody else potentially because we were not, I, I don't have clarity and we, we brought this up before as to whether there could be situations where the board could delegate on um, individuals other than the director or the chairperson. Um, so Ms. Mr. Lear might have an answer for that. Is this an exclusive delegation? Like, um, could we, for example, delegate on the director representing the board before external entities? Or will we have to rely on the chairperson to delegate that because this is an exclusive delegation? Um, no, I mean, all of these come back to board delegations and the board always retains the authority to change its delegations essentially at any time. So, um, you know, even anything delegated today, technically, if agendized, right, could be taken up again at the next month and um, uh, uh, delegations could be changed, rescinded, extended, amended. Um, those are all um, things the boards can do at this point. And the process for that will be to put on the agenda the review or revisiting this document. Is, will that be the process to revise it? Uh, absolutely. Just yes, yes. I would say probably that the, if there's interest in um, in considering to either fine tune this or, or further amend, then um, I, I would envision probably an agenda item something along the lines of um, discussion and action on the amendment to the board handbook. Um, uh, and what will be the timeline in terms of our need to approve this this handbook? Is that something that we have to approve within, you know, three months or one month? Or what was the timeline for that? My understanding is that we can continue to consider the handbook. We haven't embedded any policies that have to be decided today in your have you, Mr. Laird? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, you know, a lot of this is just to uh, reflect sort of how how we agree to operate. So, um, you no, know, to your point, anything uh, outside of this document that's required, um, like the conflict of interest code, we've been monitoring from that capacity. But uh, the the handbook itself can be further um, discussed, and it is not required to be adopted on a certain timetable. And there are additional policies that we'll want to add to the list of required policies, which will also require a separate discussion, um, as I understand it. So the handbook would need to be revisited um, at least one more time, if not a couple more times over the coming months and year, uh, because I think there are other, other deadlines 
for trainings and things. Um, so we would need we would need to talk about this again. Um, if that's the case, my preference would be to have a little bit more time to to review it. Like I said at the beginning, um, I didn't have a copy until Thursday, and it might be that you know after having the time, I'm perfectly um, okay with just some edits. But um, my preference will be to have additional time. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, are there other are there other comments? And then I will try to summarize where we are thus far. Mr. Thompson? Um, so I just want to understand how we're proceeding. So we're not approving this today. Are we submitting our comments to Mr. Laird or how are we? I, I have, there's a few sections that I have a concern with. I'd also like to hear, it was, it was mentioned that these are kind of usual and customary. Um, I, in the, in the time that we had, I went and found one that's not, it's for the, Public Utilities Commission, but had some language in it that I thought as far as engagement with external stakeholders and others or uh, how those members express their views that, that I would be more comfortable with. Um, happy to send that along. Uh, process, like, what, how are we going to do this? Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, let's hear from Mr. Lay and then I will circle back and respond. Mr. Lee, you're on mute. About that. Yeah, my question is kind of on that, that point too is, you know, how do we, when we want to like build, because we we're building consensus like at these meetings, but um, yeah, how do we prep things so that we can, we can get to it? Uh, can we send it to you and you not share it with anyone else? Is that as spoke, Huffin spoke at that point? Yeah, it, well, my understanding is that it will be assuming that I get comments um, on the same item, which we, we could, might be the board handbook itself um, from more than one person. So um, uh, why, how about this? Shall I propose, um, a, propose um, a path forward? And then we can see what everybody thinks about that. Uh, Mr. Lay, did you want to um, further comment? Before. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that question stemmed from an earlier one about um, the, the hiring and, you know, I think mm -hmm. you mentioned that you would be the one getting all of the resumes and kind of providing us a short list of, of folks for us to consider that closed session. Um, and, you know, I was thinking of, you know, well, we can't communicate to each other. Is, is there any way for us to also kind of like send even if it's just a one-way conversation, send you know kind of our favorites and like among the resumes, or even see the resumes of the people applying, and, and this kind of is just related to just how our workflow would would happen just in general. My understanding is that Bagley Keen um, precludes a lot of that happening outside of a public meeting. Um, there is the possibility of advisory subcommittees, as we discussed, members of the public can send us information. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't matter if someone is a board member, if they're part of a hub and spoke or serial communication, that would still then be a serial or hub and spoke communication between board members. Um, so Bagley King really does put its thumb on the scale of discussing all matters um, in a public meeting. It is a little bit, um, it's the, um, the underlying purpose of the law was specifically to balance in favor of public transparency over efficiency. Um, I do think that the drafters of the law weren't necessarily considering having to actually start um, an agency, um, but, um, but it, is, it is what we are operating under and that is very much the public policy behind the law. Um, so, it, so it does limit sort of how we can communicate outside of a meeting like this which I'm sure the members of the public who graciously joined us are seeing us, you know, having pretty detailed conversations um, because the purpose of Bagley Keen is for us to um, be very transparent and to do things in a public meeting. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Okay, so here is what I propose. Um, Ms. De La Torre, is that all right? Or do you, okay, wonderful. Here, here's what I propose. Um, I propose that 
um, during this discussion, we collect um, specific um, questions that um, board members would like to be answered and or changes board members would like to be considered for the handbook, understanding that um, you may not have all specific changes ready now, but you might as well collect them um, now. And then between this meeting and the next meeting, um, I will request that Mr. Laird um, uh, help me go through and make sure that we have um, reviewed all of the suggestions, incorporated them uh, where possible or where we see a conflict, um, plan to bring that to the next meeting um, and um, basically um, do revisions for the handbook um, for us to consider again at the next meeting. That's what I propose um, that we, how we proceed. Uh, that works for me. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, all right. Um, so we already have one specific um, proposed change from Ms. De La Torre. That was pretty straightforward. Um, Mr. Thompson alluded to perhaps others. Do you have any specific um, specific um, changes? Not to put you on the spot. I just remember that you you mentioned that um, there were some potential changes, and we might as well collect them now if we can. Sure. Uh, yeah, I do. I, so there was I'm just kind of going through them on page four. Um, the I thought the question that the Miss Delatory posed was a good one in that are these exclusive uh, and I think we should clarify that because if if the chair is exclusively um, designated to do certain things that I, I guess I would read that as to the exclusion of others um, and I'd maybe it's a distinction between on behalf of the board versus on behalf of themselves as board members um, you know, I think there are other ways to approach that, one of which would be none of us should represent that we're speaking for the other four, um, presumably including the chairperson, um, unless there's a decision already made. But kind of forward looking statements on on actions, we should all be cautious about. So I don't know how you how you slice that, but um, I would contrast that with there's a section in the, the CPUC version that I saw. Um, so they say media representatives frequently contact commissioners seeking background information or quotes. It is acceptable and indeed preferable that any direct contact be channeled through the public information office, a different approach. Um, you know, a recommendation, but not a, a prohibition. Um, there's, on, on communications with outside folks says be, that commissioners should be clear whether they are acting in their professional capacity or representing personal interests. If a commissioner appears before or corresponds with another governmental agency or organization to give a statement, the commissioner should indicate whether his or her statement reflects personal opinion or is the official stance of the CPUC, whether this is the majority or minority opinion. Uh, if the commissioner is representing the the CPUC, the commissioner should indicate the official position on an issue as reflected in the vote on the issue. Uh, if a commissioner who did not vote with a majority on a matter wishes to speak to, to the reasons for his or her vote, the commissioner should do so in a way that respectfully recognizes commissioner deliberation. Th this was an important distinction in this to me because there's a section later where it sounds like once the board takes a position, we should all hew to that position as opposed to dissenters explaining the reasons for their dissent. Uh, and I think that's an important part of a policy process that, that if we have disagreements, uh, even after a vote, we're able to discuss them in a respectful way. Um, on page seven, um, the that's incorporated second bullet general rules of conduct. The board member shall not speak or act for the board without proper authorization. Um, I think that is captured in the sentiment of the, the CPUC version, which is just distinguish whether or not you're speaking for yourself or, or others. The third bullet was the one I was referring to. Board members shall not privately or publicly lobby for, publicly endorse or otherwise engage 
in any personal efforts that would tend to promote their own personal or political views or goals when those are in direct opposition to the official position adopted by the board. That makes me uncomfortable that if the board has a position, a dissenter can't say, I, I think that's incorrect, or uh, you know, I, I think we should do something different. Um, that seems appropriate in a public policy debate that a dissenter may voice their dissent. Um, and I read that to say, once the board acts, we all fall in line. Um, and Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Is it all right if we pause for just a second? Yeah, sure. Um, so that I can ask Mr. Laird about this. I read this as um, conduct related to personal conflicts of interest. Interesting. Um, okay. So um, I would like to ask Mr. Laird um, if he, or we could just, we could put this in the list of things to consider. Um, understanding, I believe I understand Mr. Thompson, um, what your goal is and what your concern is with language that might um, seem to preclude board members from being able to express their own um, policy opinion. Um, I, think I, I think I have a good sense of that. Um, uh, so we could just kind of leave it there and explore this, um, but perhaps Mr. Laird has an answer ready. I, I was actually going to recommend what you just suggested, uh, okay. Chair Urban, that uh, we, we go ahead and uh, just confirm, you know, there isn't any other legal parameters that kind of control anything in here before we uh, agree to strike. But um, yeah, once we explore, we'll report back on on, uh, on that, but but sounds reasonable. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, would you please continue? Sure. Um, on page eight at the top, um, in under general, all communications related to any board action or policy uh, to any individual organization or representative of the media shall only be made, shall be made only by the chairperson, chairperson's designee or executive director. Um, it, that seems, you know, if a consumer group or privacy advocate or an industry group asks us about a board action or policy, um, I think we should be able to speak to the action of the board without permission, uh, as long as we're, we are accurately describing the board's policy, um, that, that seemed very restrictive to me. Thank you. Uh, and I don't know if that's on a forward-looking or a backward-looking basis or both. Um, so it was, un, it was unclear to me. Um, the vein of all of this is, you know, I think we need to engage in a robust public policy debate and be in communication with and accessible to interested parties. And, and there, the things in here that seem to curtail that are of concern to me. Thank you, I do understand. And um, my understanding is that the CPUC handbook, which I confess I did not see, um, that is one I didn't see. Um, I did see others that um, were more restrictive. Um, uh, um, uh, covers, has language that you think covers that nicely. Um, I do see when you read, when uh, I do see, um, how you are reading that again, uh, the, the thought behind it was speaking for the board, um, but there's a difference between that and speaking as a board member with a board member's opinion. Um, all right, so um, did you have other specific um, people, um, items you would like to point out? <laughs> I do, but I, I feel like I'm monopolizing the time. <laughs> Go for it, really. Um, or, or you can direct. Like, like this the I would like a little bit more. I read this yesterday, and there, these things jumped out at me. I'd probably like a little bit more time to, to digest it. Okay. Um, the we talked about the board member written correspondence and mailings. Um, again, I mean that, that seems to curtail our our ability to engage in a public policy debate um, if we are circums circumscribed from talking about or in writing or other manners. Uh, matters under the jurisdiction or responsibility of the board. Um, you know, I think we, we should be participating in that dialogue and that, that public policy debate. So the portion after or I would recommend striking um, in, that, in that sense. Um, I think those were those were the major things. I've got a couple of other small things. I'm happy to circulate the the CPUC thing that I found uh, if that's useful to folks uh, for consideration of other ways to approach this. Thank you, uh, Mr. Laird. I was actually going to ask about that. Um, what is the process by which we could add the CPUC handbook um, 
to, uh, is, it, is it all right since we've discussed it in the meeting um, for Mr. Thompson to circulate that to you and for him to, for you to circulate it to us or do we need to follow a different process? Um, no, happy to, happy to circulate it uh, to the group and then just so everybody's aware, you know, anything brought to the attention of the board at one of these meetings is a publicly available document, which I assume this already was, <laughs> in fact, um, but sh should anybody from the public want to request a copy of this, um, uh, they would be entitled to it. Great, thank you. Um, all right, um, I have um, another item, but I'm going to um, go to Ms. De La Torre next. I was just going to suggest regarding this item, if there's no urgency in terms of a timeline for approval, it might be something that we don't want to currently prioritize because we have so many other things that are urgent that we need to get done. Um, there could be some items here that are um, rather relevant, like um, coordinating some of the actions when we're um, approached by media or, uh, you know, if, if there is something that's specific, that's urgent, we could just address that piece as opposed to trying to engage in, in you know, providing a final document that it, you know, could potentially go beyond 10 pages when we have so many other things that, that we need to address. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Mr. Lay? Yeah, you know, in that vein, um... Maybe this is the right place to propose like a, a subcommittee for that that task. It feels like uh, Mr. Thompson, Ms. De La Torre have, you know, um, stuff to add. So maybe that could be a good first subcommittee. That. Thank you, Mr. Lay. We will need to take that up under subcommittees, um, but it's noted and I appreciate that. Um, to Ms. De La Torre's um, process point as well. Um, if others have not noticed um, anything else that they think is urgent and want us to um, decide on right now, I have one item um, which is related to the communications policy, um, largely because um, I and I would expect others have received speaking invitations. Um, and so I would like to, um, uh, I would like to know uh, what the board's uh, preferred policy is with regards um, to certain kinds of communications. Uh, so um, what I now propose um, is that um, uh, Mr. Laird and I go ahead and take all the comments that we've received, um, work on revisions. Um, we may also consider um, a subcommittee when we get to that point uh, on the agenda or having a subcommittee have this as part of its charge. That could be another option. Um, and then what I would um, value now would be um, uh, a sense of whether, or we can, we can actually, I think, vote on this and have it be a small subsidiary policy of whether it, um, the board um, considers it to be appropriate for board members to um, speak um, publicly including on issues that relate to the jurisdiction of the board, so long as they do not speak, do not purport to speak for the board itself, and so long as they are, sure, are certain to be clear in the oral remarks or written um, materials that they are not speaking um, for the board or for the agency. Um, and I, I, I Mr. Lay, mm -hmm. Mr. Lay, and then Ms. Ms. Sierra. Oh, I just I wanted. To, yeah, is that did you ask for a motion or is that uh, we're, we're too soon for that? Um, well, uh, if there's comment, let's do that first. But um, that would be the form of a motion, I think. Ms. Sierra. Uh, Ms. Yara, you have frozen, um, one of the challenges of meeting remotely. Um, so uh, I will try to return to you in a moment, Ms. De La Torre. I, I, just, I just question if we need a motion on something like that. It seems to me that this, you know, freedom of speech is a value that is highly protected under the U.S. Constitution. And I don't understand that, you know, we will need an authorization 
from the board to express our personal opinions. It just seems to me that that's the natural, you know, kind of uh, outcome of, of, of US um, protection for freedom of speech. And so I, I question whether we need a, a motion for something like that. The, um, the gloss on it would be the expectation um, to clearly say that one is not speaking for the board. But to your point, um, yes, I agree. And I would again ask Mr. Laird if we, if we need um, to make a decision on this in order to move forward or if we can wait. Uh, you're not required to, to uh, vote on this item today and, and there is not a statutory deadline associated with it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Laird. Um, uh, given that, Ms. De La Torre, um, are you opposed to uh, considering a motion that involves the disclaimer, um, or um, or are you in favor of, of moving forward? With right. uh, the disclaimer, I think, is customary, and I totally agree with uh, the need to be um, clear to the public. So if you want to make that into a motion, I, I will definitely support it. Is there further comment? Ms. Sierra, I know had a comment um, that she was unable to make, so I want to be sure that we can circle back to her. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Sorry about that, I lost my connection, so. I'm not sure what I what I miss. I think I was ready to um, make a comment when that happens, and this was about the the one part to see if we would all agree on the um, issue about speaking at um, conferences or um, public events, and that just to we can do that um, as long as we're clear, as I understand it, that. Um, we're not speaking on behalf of the board or official capacity as a board member. And um, it seems to me that that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think it is important for all of us just so we have a clear kind of the rules of the road. You know, I think this conversation has been really helpful, kind of what to think about how to maybe clarify some of this. But I think that provision was pretty clear. I don't, I don't see that we would have to add that much more. But anyway, that's what I wanted just to um, remark on. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. And I think what you missed was that Ms. De La Torre pointed out that we don't need a policy with regards to individual speech. Um, mm -hmm. We already have the protection um, of the First Amendment in the California Constitution with regards to individual speech. Um, the addition would be the expectation to make clear that we're not speaking yes. to the board. Um, all right, thank you all very much um, for the discussion. Um, I will, um, uh, of the board handbook, um, and this potential specific, how we shall move forward um, speaking um, in the future. Um, I would now like to ask whether there is any public comment. Thank you, Chairperson. As a reminder for anyone who'd like to make a public comment, uh, please locate the raised hand icon on your screen or press star nine if you're collect, uh, connected by telephone. I believe we have a comment from Pat. Uh, Pat, you have three minutes. Pat, if you'd like to make a comment, you are able to do so at this time. Mr. Joseph Pinero, Pat is on mute. Is that something that you need to remove? Uh, I have clicked ask to unmute. All right, looks like we have one uh, additional comment. Uh, I will circle back and see if Pat is able to connect. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Kelly V. Oh, excuse me, sorry about that. Kelly, you have three minutes. Can you hear me this time? Yes, thank you. Hello? Okay, great, thank you. First of all, um, congratulations to everybody on your appointment. And then I did have a question. I missed um, where, which department Mr. Laird is um, on loan from. And I also wanted to follow up. He had mentioned that uh, the documents that have been discussed um, at this meeting would be available to members of the public upon request. And I wasn't sure if they were 
going to be in, um, posted on the new website or if it is by request only that those documents are made available. Thank you, um, Kelly V. Um, Philip Laird is the Deputy General Counsel at the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. And the materials we are discussing are posted on the website at the same place that the agenda is posted, um, with the exception of the potential um, example handbook from the California Public Utilities Commission. Mr. Laird? You said everything I was going to say. That's exactly right. Um, uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Great. Mr. Joseph Pinero, are there further, further public comment? Yes, it looks like we have a comment from Ray Kitty. Ray, you have three minutes. No, no, I'm sorry. That was a mistake. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And let's try one more time for Pat, if you have a comment. Pat, you are unmuted uh, if you'd like to make a comment. All right. Uh, looks like that's not working at this time for Pat. Uh, if you'd like to make a comment later, you're welcome to uh, provide your comment during the general public comment period toward the end of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. I also wanted to amend um, what I just said to Ms. Uh, Kelly V. Uh, the delegation of authority that we discussed is not yet on the website, but will be um, posted on the website um, for the public to consider. Um, uh, sometimes we have presentations or other things that we discuss and then we will, we will post them um, up on the website as soon as they can be made um, accessible. Uh, thank you everyone um, for their comments. Uh, further comments and questions from the board, Mr. Thompson? A uh, quick question. Am I sending Mr. Laird the CPUC documents? How are we proceeding with that? Or I can just send the, the links. They're publicly available on their website. That was my understanding. Mr. Laird, can you confirm? Yes, please feel free to send me the link and I can distribute to make sure everybody receives it and then we'll make sure it's made available on our website as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Laird and Mr. Thompson. If there is no um, further comment, um, then um, to summarize our discussion, um, we have collected a number of um, changes and items to research related to the draft um, handbook for the um, California public, excuse me, California, um, the CPPA board. Um, and um, we will, um, Mr. Laird and I and or um, uh, members of a subcommittee to be discussed in the next agenda item. We'll work on that between now and the next meeting. Uh, Mr. Thompson is distributing a potentially helpful example to Mr. Laird, who will distribute it to the board. We will not make a, uh, we will not take an action item on the handbook overall at this time, um, but we will now um, consider a brief action item related to the policy um, for, for public speaking um, and um, uh, related um, items. Um, I propose that um, the board um, affirm its understanding that board members uh, may speak um, in public venues um, and um, uh, in public written form, um, so long as they make clear um, uh, in a standard form that they are not speaking for the board of the California Privacy Protection Agency or for the California Privacy Protection Agency. Um, may I have, um, would someone please make that motion? I so move. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Mr. Joseph Pinero, would you please conduct the roll call vote? Yes, thank you, Chairperson. So Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Ms. De La Torre, aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Mr. Lay, aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Ms. Sierra, aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Thompson, aye. And Chairperson Urban? Aye. The, um, excuse me, the motion um, passes uh, with a vote of five aye 
uh, five yes, uh, zero no, and no abstentions. Um, we can now move on to agenda item eight. We could also take a quick 10 minute break. Um, I just like to gauge the um, sense of the board, whether people would like a quick break or if you're ready to move on to the next agenda item. I'm ready to move on. Ready to move on, thank you. Um, do I have nods from others? Yes, all right, wonderful. Thank you very much, board members. We will move on now to agenda item. And by the way, thank you um, for the robust discussion um, and um, uh, a plan uh, to move forward with uh, overall policies um, for the board as um, described in the handbook. Agenda item number 10, um, subcommittees of the board. As Mr. Laird explained, the Bagley Keen Open Meetings Act applies to any communications among three or more board members, and that includes serial communications or hub and spoke communications. Many boards and commissions have subcommittees of two members to allow for advisory work to be done between public meetings. My view is that subcommittees are an important and necessary tool for this board to use to make progress toward our goals and fulfill our responsibilities, um, which we have discussed um, at length today, um, especially while we're working um, to hire for director positions and working to put in place uh, either temporary and or permanent staff. Um, that said, I also realize that board members are volunteers um, who have limited time. Um, and I in thinking about um, what work we might do in two-person advisory subcommittees that would help move um, the uh, goals of the board and the agency forward, um, try to um, be respectful of that and take into account board members' time. Um, to begin, I have three um, proposed subcommittees. My understanding is that common practice would be for the chair to develop subcommittees and assign um, members. Um, I would like, however, to have a discussion uh, as well, um, given particularly since we have not met before. Um, uh, um, I'm hoping that I have, I have, um, I've headed in a reasonable direction, um, but I think that it is worth discussing. And we've also had some discussion earlier in the day that may inform um, how the, the best way to move forward. So um, the first of the three um, subcommittees would be a regulations subcommittee. The subcommittee is charged with advising the board on priorities and planning for the upcoming rulemaking. Um, that would be considering what rulemaking is required, um, what is a priority, um, and also what staffing and resources um, are necessary or would be helpful to accomplish that. Um, it could include um, considering a request for information or other aspects of information gathering um, that could feed into the rulemaking. So that is the first subcommittee that I propose. Um, and I propose that that would be Ms. De La Torre and myself um, to um, research these issues and prepare um, a report um, for the board to consider at our next meeting. The second um, subcommittee um, that um, I would like us to consider is the Public Awareness and Guidance Subcommittee. Um, we spent quite a lot of time, um, understandably, talking about our rulemaking duties. We have a number of other duties under the California Privacy Rights Act um, and the California Consumer Privacy Act, um, which have um, taken effect. And those include um, uh, um, um, promoting public awareness and uh, guidance um, under uh, section uh, 1798.199.4. 40 uh, D through F. So uh, it's public public awareness um, uh, of the of the risks and the harms um, and um, opportunities to protect um, consumers' individual privacy, uh, guidance for consumers, and guidance for businesses. Um, those two subsections also include um, a couple of other uh, things. Um, they include. Um, uh, excuse me, um, they also include, um, I apologize, I lost my, um, my notes. Give me one second because I want to be sure that I describe this properly. All right. 
Um, they include promote public awareness and understanding of the risks, rules, responsibilities, safeguards, and rights in relation to the collection, use, sale, and disclosure of personal information, including the rights of minors with respect to their own information, to provide guidance to consumers regarding their rights under the law, and to provide guidance to businesses regarding their duties and responsibilities um, under the law. Um, the, they also include um, a public report summarizing risk assessments filed with the agency, um, which is uh, um, something that will be coming down the pike, and um, uh, appointing the chief privacy auditor. So those last two items that are melded together with the public awareness and guidance items uh, were not things that I was thinking of charging the subcommittee with. Rather, I was thinking of charging the subcommittee um, with, um, with um, uh, um, considering um, uh, initial um, planning um, actions and priorities for fulfilling those public awareness um, uh, duties of the board. Um, for example, identifying um, any um, immediate needs uh, and particularly considering how the board may uh, address and respond to the needs of all of our diverse California communities. Uh, so one um, subcommittee looking at the regulation um, responsibilities, another subcommittee looking at the public awareness and guidance responsibilities, and for the second um, subcommittee, I, was, um, I would suggest Mr. Lay and Mr. Thompson. And we have since talked about some administrative things, so we might want to talk about that a bit. That was the um, initial um, thought. The third um, subcommittee um, will not be surprising to the group, given the discussion that we've had um, throughout the day. Um, this would be um, a, a startup and administration subcommittee um, as a casual um, title for it. Um, charged with working with BCSH, uh, uh, the um, Office of the Attorney General, and other agency staff to understand administrative issues necessary to build the agency and advise the board on any issues the board needs to consider in parallel with hiring an executive director. Um, we've talked about a number of those issues today. Um, my thinking is that there will probably be other administrative issues that crop up. Um, there are certainly um, things that I can do operating under the delegation of authority, but I can also imagine that there are um, questions that the board would want to consider, um, particularly if it takes a while to hire an executive director. For example, um, perhaps some more um, detail on a potential organization of the agency um, and some of the other things that we've spoken about earlier today. Um, and for that subcommittee, um, I um, was proposing Ms. Sierra, um, to take advantage of her long experience in California government, which I think would be incredibly helpful here, um, and, and myself. Um, so everybody's been assigned to one subcommittee except for me. I ended up with two um, in an attempt to be equitable. This is the um, first um, set of subcommittees um, that I was thinking could get us going. Um, I think of these as ad hoc subcommittees. Um, that um, some functions of which would presumably be replaced by the executive director and staff when they arrive, um, at which point we would consider additional um, subcommittees in place of those. For example, we will eventually need a subcommittee um, to help with grant making, um, which is one of our other duties under the law. All right, um, comments and questions from members of the board. Apologies, Ms. De La Torre. You caught me taking a drink, please. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so in terms of, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with your assessment that we need to get organized in subcommittees to push forward some of these um, major tasks that we have ahead. Um, but my initial reaction to, to some of the, the structure that you proposed was um, we need to think about timing, what is urgent right now versus what might have to happen in the future. Um, one of the committees that you mentioned, public awareness, um, which is a subject dear and near to my heart that I think that we should engage in as an agency. 
seems to me um, a topic that might not need immediate action, particularly because we are relying on the California AG currently enforcing CCPA and they have issued some guidelines for business already. Plus, I'm not sure to what degree um, guidelines can be issued when we're just starting the rulemaking process. So not to detract from the need of the, of the committee, but just to think about it in terms of how can we maximize our initial impact by kind of allocating resources to what is more um, an immediate need. So um, that's, that was my initial reaction to, to that idea. And uh, in terms of the rulemaking, I think that we might want to divide that. We might want to have two committees on rulemaking as opposed to one. And number one, because I think that we all should participate in the process. It's, it's, it's going to be a very, um, it's going to be a very heavy lift. And I think that we should think in terms of what is, uh, what are our backgrounds and, you know, how those align us to perhaps be of you know better assistance with specific areas. Um, one thing that um, comes to my mind, and, and Mr. Lee, I don't really know you well. I just met you um, today, but um, he is a board member that seems to have a lot of experience with um, AI, and that's um, something that might be part of the rules that we have to consider. So engaging his expertise in terms of um, making sure that you know the, there's a um, maybe, like I said, two or even three different committees assigned to rulemaking and just divide the, the, the topics of, of the rules. And this might be something that we have to do down the road. Uh, Mrs. Urban, to your point, maybe we need to just start with one to kind of divide it, but it's just, it's a, it's a major commitment. So I don't think that we can achieve it um, with just, you know, just one subcommittee. Um, my preference will be yes. to think about it in a more broad manner. Yes, to be, to be clear, the idea for the first subcommittee would be actually to um, develop advice for the board on exactly that sort of deeper dive on the regulations. Um, there's also a question of how finally we can cut the subcommittees. Um, and um, we would need to um, consider um, whether we can parcel out topics um, and still fall within the two person subcommittee. I don't see an initial reason why we could not do it, um, but it is something we would need to consider. Um, Ms. Sierra? You're on mute, Ms. Sierra. There, that should be better. Okay, so um, I had the same thought, and I, I do like the idea of starting with respect to the subcommittee for regulations. And um, this is my experience, developing regulations becomes it's quite complex. And I think if, the, if we start with the one subcommittee, maybe as you've already been talking about is what logically, if we ended up with three subcommittees, there may be a way to divide the work. And I would imagine all of us are going to want to really be involved in you know, hearing the public input. Um, and if we have forums or, um, any you know venue and where we're hearing um, the input from stakeholders, we're all going to want to be part of that anyway. Um, so I think down the road that does make sense. Looking forward, that we'll probably end up with three different subcommittees for that. You know, to be able to meet our statutory deadline or a deadline to get these um, regulations in place. Um, you know, and on the issue of public awareness, you know, I. In my mind, it would make a lot of sense to get started. And if the regulation work becomes quite heavy, which it probably will at a certain amount of time, then some of that work we may have to place on the back burner, but at least the subcommittee can come up with a plan, you know, and start getting, you know, working, thinking ahead for the next, you know, six to 12 months of the different public awareness issues and campaigns or strategies that the um, board would want to engage in. So I like the idea of these three. I'm very happy to serve on the um, subcommittee with respect to the administrative issues and tapping into my um, experience working with the state and eight different agencies um, in starting up um, new programs. Um, but I just think that ultimately we we'll probably will end up with more subcommittees and, and that, that's fine. So Thank you. I think it's a good plan. Yes, I, I agree. I would like to clarify 
that um, my thinking behind the initial subcommute is indeed to take a look to create an initial plan with the understanding that the rulemaking is going to be a very large proportion of our time until we fulfill that duty. Um, the Attorney General's Office, as Mr. Latore alluded to, has some very good um, public awareness materials that they've already created. So my hope would be that part of the um, role that that subcommittee would play would be to reveal what's available, compare it um, to what we are being asked to do in the law, and simply advise the board on what our next steps might be, which would, could include, and I think should include, um, how, um, how the subcommittee thinks that things should be prioritized in light of our various other obligations. Mr. Thompson. Um, I agree with what Ms. Delatory said, and I, I'm trying to, it sounds like chairperson, you largely agree also as far as the, the biggest chunk of work that's ahead of us and the um, is the developing of, of the regulations. Um, sounds like we need additional guidance on how that could be divided uh, and still comply with the strictures around subcommittees. So if I'm hearing this correctly, the, sub, the regulation subcommittee would look at the breadth of the regulations that we are to promulgate in the next year um, and devise a way to divide that work up um, that is is compliant with Bagley Keen and, and what other applicable laws. Is that, am I hearing that correctly? Yes, you've reflected at least my intent, if not my expression at this time of the day. So apologies okay. if I'm unclear. Uh, Mr. Lay? Yeah, I was wondering, um, you know, what kind of, uh, do we have any staff resources to tap into with uh, these subcommittees? Um, Um, thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, we have, uh, so um, BCSH um, staff have been um, supporting our work thus far in terms of um, helping us put together, you know, the policies and things that we need. Um, uh, I think that um, we would be um, asking um, uh, staff what they can provide um, in terms of staffing for, for the subcommittees. Um, there's a there's again there's a little bit of a of um, um, a kind of irrefutable fact um, that um, there's a fair amount of work to do um, at the same time as we don't yet have dedicated staff. Um, but so I, I can't answer with specifics. Um, I did you know in in thinking through potential initial assignments, I did try to take into account availability of time. Um, but I also might have I might have gotten it wrong, um, and um, uh, in, you know any any of these endeavors could be very um, time consuming. Um, so the hope would be that um, the initial pass would be to just give the board some advice, um, so we can make decisions about how to move forward. Um, that said, also my um, initial ideas for assignments were that so. Um, I certainly agree with Ms. Sierra, for example, Mr. Lay, that you have um, quite a bit of experience um, with regulatory proceedings. Um, so I would invite people to express interest um, as well. Um, again, understanding that people do have limited resources. Ms. De La Torre? Um, apologies in advance if this is not the right item to, to bring this up, but in terms of rulemaking, the most urgent thing that we should consider doing is open um, the rulemaking process for comments, for informal comments before we draft our initial version of the regulations. To the extent that that might require approval by the board, is that something that we could um, approve today so that we can make sure that we you know, expedite as much as possible that process and we start um, gathering those comments? Um, I don't think that we can. Um, I think we would need a dedicated agenda item for that. 
that is something that the subcommittee could propose um, as part of its report. Um, subcommittees cannot be delegated authority, but um, Mr. Laird, as part of their advisory capacity, um, they could make a proposal like that at the next meeting. Is that correct? Um, they could. And, and I guess I would say, you know, in terms of um, how I've seen subcommittees like this work previously for, for other boards, um, I mean, I, I think part of the idea being discussed here is that the subcommittee will sort of um, be that processing body to help kind of process a lot of the information and then kind of uh, consider it and, and coordinate it into recommendations uh, to the full board. So it, it's an interesting question in terms of, I, I suppose there is opportunity by virtue, for instance, of, I, I think there would be an opportunity for a subcommittee to um, solicit public comment on a topic. It's just there wouldn't be much to do with it until they brought that information to the full board is, is what I would say. Um, so I, I think if it's within the realm of what we, we are looking to assign the subcommittee to go ahead and, and commence um, fact gathering, for instance, um, I, I think that's within the purview of, of this discussion item and within the general subcommittee sort of establishment and uh, model being, being discussed here today. Um, and then, uh, you know, happy also, of course, to, to discuss with subcommittees sort of where maybe those authorities begin and end. Essentially, what I would say is a subcommittee cannot vote to, you know, start maybe the official 45 day public comment period on their without the board's approval uh, or especially adopt a regulation that much is clear. Um, but oftentimes these subcommittees, uh, if they want to, for instance, although they can meet in private, they could also meet in public. They could do a, a, an open meeting of this forum to solicit information and consider a topic if that's what they'd like to do. Um, again, it's just then what they do with that information. Uh, that's where the advisory nature of the body then is just to deliver essentially a recommendation to the board. All right. Um, so just, just so to be sure that I'm, I'm clear. Um, as part of the subcommittee of information gathering um, capacity as part of its advisory capacity, um, the subcommittee could go ahead and request um, public comment, not the rulemaking um, official notice that would start the 45 days, but information gathering like a request for information or a public conversation. Okay. Ms. De La Torre, does that answer your question? Right, I, I was going to do exactly what you did, which is summarize. <laughs> so yes, if, if what you're saying is a summary, I think that that, that is beneficial. I was going to ask, um, and again, I'm not sure if I'm the right item in the agenda, but um, when do we expect the next meeting to actually happen? Is it within a month? Is it within three that, months? That is, I believe, three agenda items from now. Okay, sorry, apologies. <laughs> yes, but, but all of these things are interconnected. I, I do understand that they are they are interconnected. Um, and we can also um, reorganize the agenda items if we think that that's necessary. Um, but there is an agenda item for, for that. Um, Mr. Lay? I was uh, <clears throat> kind of wondering, so when we do the request for public comment, will we be able to use the website? um and like or do we just kind of do that through our own devices um yeah that's just what's the process uh do you like have we we get our emails and then we can put that up on the website and also um if you could share um uh, kind of the the description of each one of the subcommittees that you uh you created and then that'll just kind of give me a better idea of what the deliverables are expected to be sure um would you like me to um, to go through them again. I actually have notes on a PowerPoint presentation. I'm happy to share my screen. Um, they're, they're fairly brief, um, but would that be helpful? Yeah, that'd be helpful. Okay. Um, as to um, the first question, um, I think that comes down to whatever process is necessary. Um, Mr. Laird, I think has been telling us that um, it's fairly open and I think that would be something for the subcommittee um, to consider um, if it wanted to uh, gather information um, prior to another board meeting with the forms in which you would like to do that. Um, the, um, the website um, is still um, pretty um, bare bones, um, but it is available um, for, for putting up notices and communicating um, with the public. 
All right, let me see um, if I. I will lose my ability to see your hands if I turn this into a presentation. So I hope this is sufficient. Um, this again is my sort of initial description. Um, it is very brief. Uh, my assumption was we would discuss the charge, but I do understand Mr. Lay, your request makes perfect sense. Um, the first one would be um, charged with, and I would say sort of reviewing and researching and then advising the board on priorities and planning for the upcoming rulemaking. Um, the thought is that probably this would spawn other proposed subcommittees as we've been discussing. Um, the second um, subcommittee I was thinking of um, is the Public Awareness and Guidance um, Subcommittee. Um, that would be charged with advising the board on priorities and planning for fulfilling the board's responsibilities um, under these areas. Um, the remainder of this quotes the language from the statute um, but the thinking would be um, for the subcommittee um, to take a look um, at what is available from the Attorney General, um, take a look at the responsibilities, and just advise the board um, on um, things that uh, the, bo the board should consider doing um, uh, in order to fulfill this responsibility, or um, if, as Ms. De La Torre pointed out, um, it's something that the board should um, um, uh, uh, consider uh, working on more substantively a little bit in the future. Um, my own hopes were that um, the subcommittee um, would uh, be um, considering um, how what is existing um, reflects the needs of everyone in the state um, uh, that considers an equity perspective. Um, but my understanding is that um, the subcommittee would um, kind of just suss that out for the board um, and report back. And then the third um, subcommittee was the Startup and Administration Subcommittee, um, uh, charged with um, working with BCSH and other agency staff um, to consider administrative agency issues, excuse me, like the ones we are discussing. Um, we could ask this subcommittee um, to um, take on uh, reviewing and revising the draft handbook, for example, um, the subcommittee would probably, again, want to consider um, priorities um, and um, report back to the board um, and advise it on any issues that the board needs uh, to understand uh, with regards to um, these administrative issues for building the agency. Um, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, thank you. Um, one observation is that um, the, well, an observation slash question. So the, the idea that the um, regulation subcommittee may be holding an informational hearing for lack of a better term to gather input from, and I don't know if it would be experts, advocates, the public, all of the above, um, on suggestions of where the board might prioritize its regulatory efforts or suggestions of, of how we conduct that process. Um, so two things, one is, you know, I, speaking for myself, I would be interested in hearing that input. Um, I don't know if there's a difference between us just taking in information at, if there's a quorum taking in information or a subcommittee taking in information, can a, can a subcommittee engage in a dialogue, ask questions, et cetera, in a way that a quorum cannot? Um, meaning if more than two are present, does that hamstring the ability to have that conversation? Um, because you know that, that kind of initial stakeholder input into how we prioritize things would be interesting to hear um, to me, I, maybe to others as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson. I believe that um, the what you're expressing um, is behind the reason why um, some boards and commissions will hold public um, meetings of subcommittees. Um, 
But uh, again, I would ask if Mr. Laird could give us um, some of the specifics. My understanding is that anytime there's a quorum, um, uh, we, um, we have to be at least very careful, which is why we've done the Bagley Keene training and the APA training, et cetera, um, in a public meeting. Um, but I would ask Mr. Laird if he um, could clarify for us. Yes, this is a, you're keeping me on my toes on Bagley Keen today. <laughs> um, no, uh, uh, what you suggest, um, especially, so, you know, I guess there's a little bit of question in my mind, you know, would the sub subcommittee in sort of taking in public comment um, do so in an otherwise um, Bagley Keen compliant meet, uh, notice meeting, for instance, would they give 10 days notice in advance? If they were to do that, just to kind of play by the same sort of transparency um, parameters, um, absolutely no problem with the other board members attending and viewing. The restriction is that the board members could not participate or provide other additional comments. So the, the idea being a subcommittee can essentially host a public meeting and that continues to be open to the entire public, public including other board meetings. But in order for it to not turn into an actual board meeting, the board members not part of the subcommittee are not permitted to participate at that time. Then when we all reconvene at a bigger meeting, you could of course discuss uh, anything you might've heard during that time um, with the rest of the subcommittee. I hope that answers your question, but essentially, yes, you could attend. You just, uh, if you weren't on the subcommittee, my advice would be not to, uh, uh, to engage in the, in the comments or issues. You can answer part of the question, not the entire question. Are there things that a two person subcommittee can do that three or more of us cannot do? Could the two person subcommittee engage in a back and forth dialogue with participants in a way that three or more of us could not? Um, correct. And I'd say the primary difference being that um, uh, you're not required on a two person advisory subcommittee to um, meet in an open uh, session or in a public, uh, public meeting. Um, so, for instance, uh, uh, Mr. Thompson, if you and Chair Urban were on a subcommittee together, uh, you could have phone conversations about the topic. You could exchange emails constantly about the topic. Um, you could engage individual members of the public or uh, other, other entities uh, for feedback or thoughts, um, it, but then you would not be able to share that information uh, uh, with other board members that you maybe um, accrued not in a public space. Uh, um, until you were in this public setting. Sorry, let me clarify the question. I'm, I'm contrasting two public meetings. So okay. if there's a public meeting of the subcommittee or a public meeting of three or more um, where information is being received from outside parties, can the public meeting of the subcommittee engage in questioning those people or having a dialogue in a public meeting in a way that three or more cannot? I understand the, the non-public distinction. Obviously, three or more cannot meet non-publicly other than in for limited purposes uh, uh, in closed session. Um, OK, so just to make sure I understand the question, are you asking if the two subcommittee members can discuss, basically have a dialogue with the public and with each other in, in, in a meeting? Is that the question? If the, if the notion that it, and maybe there may be assumptions in what I'm asking. If the idea is that we as a body and our subcommittees want input from stakeholders, the public, we could receive, the subcommittee could receive that in a public meeting. Um, what I suggested is I'd be interested in hearing what that input is. And um, you said, you know, a board member could also attend effectively as a member of the public is what I took you to mean. What I'm asking is, could all five of us or three or more of us have a public meeting, properly noticed, et cetera, where we hear from that same group of people and ask that same group of people questions, in effect, an informational hearing. Um, I'm envisioning the subcommittee being a dialogue, an informational hearing, mm -hmm. or a public meeting being an informational hearing. And I, like I said, there's maybe a number of assumptions in, in the way I'm asking that. I did not know if two could do things in a public meeting that three or more could not. Meaning mm. ask questions, receive information. Does that mean, did I clarify yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think I understand. Um, 
Not really, but I guess what I would say is I think you can engage in that same dialogue in this larger format right now. So right now, nothing's prohibiting this board necessarily from engaging with the public in conversation right now about um, topics as they come up. Now, again, what becomes a little bit difficult in these situations, right, are sort of um, fairly and uniformly treating public comment, which you are required to do uh, under the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. So um, to your point, I, I, I suppose, um, for instance, a subcommittee, um, you know, not having to require, uh, not having to uh, comply with all elements of the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act uh, could, for instance, give, um, you know, lengthier comment opportunities to other people than, than, than to some, um, could choose to respond to some and not others, you know, um, although again, even that's something technically you as the board can do right now. But, um, you know, I, I, th there's a few things that, that I suppose they could treat differently that they would not be required to comply with in that meeting setting. Um, it, for example, you know, uh, this isn't to your question, but, you know, they wouldn't have to comply with the 10 day notice. They could choose to notice, give everyone five days notice, have their meeting. Um, that would be acceptable because again, this is a meeting that doesn't necessarily have to comply with this act. Um, then in terms of choosing which, which options they want to give the public to participate, then that would be up to that subcommittee. And if the meeting were noticed as though it were a regular public meeting, 10 days notice, um, agenda and so forth, um, then there it would simply be a public meeting, is that correct? Uh, it's interesting. At that point, I would typically advise just that you go ahead and treat the meeting like a public meeting because you're essentially complying with all other components of the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. And so, um, you know, to, but, but Again, technically, um, even if they're not doing, um, even if they do that, it's still not uh, a meeting that's subject to the Bagley Keen requirements. Those would just, that would all be completely optional to, to choose to um, use some of those processes uh, for the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Laird. I should say, I was initially thinking of something somewhat more modest, but I, um, in that the subcommittee would have a, sort of a plan or ideas um, for this kind of, of input and other components of uh, getting ready for the rulemaking process. On the other hand, I may have been being too optimistic about when we're able to schedule our next board meeting, um, which, is a, which is a future agenda item. Um, Ms. De La Torre, and then Mr. Lay. Sure, I was wondering if it might be helpful for me to um, give a summary of the process that the AG follow before they issue their regulations for CCPA because I think they follow a, a good model and we're talking about pre-rule making activities meaning there's a lot of flexibility on what can or cannot be done to Mr. Thompson's uh, point but um, maybe it's helpful if I um, if I summarize the and maybe um, Ms. Uh, Sierra might have to correct me on this um, but uh, will that be helpful, Ms. Ms. Uh, Chairman? Well, I think that's a little beyond the scope of the agenda item. I think it would be incredibly helpful um, um, in, in, our, in our next meeting. Um, um, I, I certainly would be happy to hear it if, um, if, it, if it's within the agenda item. I think, it's a, I think that's a little bit um, far afield from the agenda item, though. Um, but if Mr. Laird um, thinks that I'm being too conservative, I am happy um, to defer. Um, I, I will just advise that to the extent um, this will support decision making around the subcommittees, um, I think it's it's reasonably within the parameters of this item. But again, um, understanding that you know this should be focused on uh, um, ultimately on, on, on discussion about how the subcommittees will operate. So to the extent this will help inform that process, um, that, that's allowable. Ms. De La Torre, I understood you to be suggesting that the timeline in which the AG's office, um, the timeline the AG's office followed would help give the board a picture of the kinds of things that a subcommittee might be considering. Um, so- well, I, Right, they don't, they, didn't have to abide by the same rules that we uh, have to abide in terms of, um, you know, board meetings because they, you know, there's no board. 
um, and it will take only two minutes. Um, I just thought that it might be helpful for um, some of the members that might not have followed the process closely to just have a, an idea of, of, of the scope of what that was. Um, not that we need to adopt it, but just as a reference. I think I could give a picture of the thing, some of the things the subcommittee could consider. Um, so um, uh, what I suggest is I would like to hear from Mr. Lay and, and then um, I think that summary would be quite helpful. Ms. Villatoy, thank you for offering. Yeah, I, um, I yeah, my, uh, forgot my point already. Um, but the other point I was gonna make was uh, in terms of the, the regulatory committee, um, you know, it, there was some mention earlier about possibly having, having two, um, you know, uh, I don't necessarily know how, how we would split that up, but um, to the extent, I don't know where we want to talk about this on the agenda, you know, I, I do have some priorities that I think, um, you know, should be considered be, before uh, we, we jump off, you know, we, we have to revisit this a month later. So I don't know what the right time to share those priorities are maybe at the future agenda items. Oh, and then the, the first uh, thing I wanted to say was um, just to summarize the point around the subcommittee uh, one, one last time, because we, we all, we've all tried, um, is it that a subcommittee essentially doesn't have to follow any of the Bagley Keene rules. So if, if Chris and I wanted to have a public meeting around the best ways to, to get public awareness around, um, you know, these new regulations we're developing, we wouldn't really, we could just do it on our own timeline. Uh, we wouldn't have to notice it. I mean, we, we'd probably want to follow Bagley Keene to the best we could just to get more people to attend. But um, essentially, we don't have to do any of those things. We can kind of just kind of act, um, you know, I just schedule it in like two weeks and then have uh, add agenda items as we go on, right? That's my understanding. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Um, so I, um, I, um, I would like to invite Ms. De La Torre to offer the timeline and the components of the rulemaking um, as an example. Um, and then um, we can circle back um, and ask Mr. Lee about priorities because I think um, we should uh, try to come to consensus about um, what work uh, we'd like to move forward with over the next month or two in between board meetings. Thank you. Um, so the process that was followed by the AG prior to issuing the first version of the regulations, which is what kicks off the official process with comments and et cetera, et cetera, is they, they did two things at the same time. One is they open a comment period for any individual to submit comments, um, written comments, and they compile all of those comments um, and they uh, eventually um, release them. They made them public. It's still posted in the AG's um, website. Um, that piece, just the written comments, um, was hundreds of pages. And we will likely get more comments because the scope of the rules that we have to address is probably, I would say, three times as much. Um, and in that respect, I think that although it is useful for all of us to get very familiar with the comments that are received, it might be more um, functionally helpful to have a staff summarize um, those comments for us um, and, and kind of read a summary that is created by either our staff, if we have a staff at the time, which might not be the case, or hopefully perhaps the AG can um, help us um, by allowing us to have some of the time of the same individuals, hopefully that, that went through the um, prior rulemaking and, and generate um, some form of report. The other thing that they did, which we might or might not want to do given the situation now with COVID, is they hosted um, meetings in physical locations across California and the idea there was to um, select physical locations that will be accessible to all Californians. So some of the meetings were in Southern California. Um, I believe there was in Sacramento one and here in Stanford, um, there was one as well. And um, people attended those meetings and were able to 
present uh, comments in a verbal form. They had those comments recorded and um, they, they created um, a written version of them, which is also still publicly available. So those are two venues to, to gather information. The one thing to consider if we were to go through the route of, um, I guess, creating a Zoom version of what they did physically um, at, at, at those locations is that it adds time because you might have to convene you know, three, four of those that could be a month, a month and a half, which is why I I'm urging all of us to consider opening um, the process for comments because it's the gathering of the comments that's going to take some time. You know, it's going to take. Um, I think it took them three to four months to actually go through go through the process, um, and that's just prior to us analyzing the information so that we can be in a good position to put forward a strong first draft for the regulations. Um, I hope that was a helpful summary. Um, I know that I might have been inaccurate in some respects. I was not prepared <laughs> to provide the summary, but um, I, I hope um, the members find it helpful. Thank you very much, De La Torre. It is helpful, Ms. De La Torre, excuse me. Um, it, is, it is helpful um, to have a sense of some of the potential options. Um, I have some worry about trying to uh, collect public comments um, when we, are very limited in staff. Um, so I think this is also, all of this has to have sort of happen in parallel, which I think we've been discussing. Um, but I, I think understanding some of the options is really useful. Um, and at least as one member of the board, I fully support as much information gathering um, as we can do in advance as, as possible. Um, Mr. Thompson? Um, to the point that Ms. Dillatory made, and, and perhaps um, um, Mr. Lay and I can work on this, is trying to narrow the scope of So I think if we're going to ask people for comment, it has to be focused. Um, it shouldn't just be open-ended, and I don't think she was suggesting that, but you know, maybe there are a series of questions that we are seeking answers to or uh, input on and or some kind of for lack of a better term, white paper type of, you know, if you're, if, if you have an interest in this issue or some sort of um, expertise to provide a, a, a paper that outlines your proposals, suggestions, concerns, um, you know, in, in a limited form and, you know, from privacy advocates, consumer groups, industry, concerned industry groups, the general public, but with a narrow set of questions. Um, rather than, than open-ended. That's just an off-the-cuff thought, but I, I, I like the idea of gathering stuff on the front end. I just think it needs to be somewhat focused to not, I don't want to create the expectation that we're listening if we're not going to be able to get through it all um, and then tell people to send us stuff and then we don't do anything with it. That, that's worse than not engaging at all. That's one observation, um, and I don't know, uh, Chairperson, if you want to react to that, and then I had one other. Um, I can go on. Tell me how you'd like me to proceed. The other, uh, it, it's unrelated to this one. Okay. Um, uh, th th thank you for the comment. Um, I I agree. Um, I just again, as one member of the board, I certainly agree um, that targeted requests, uh, a plan for processing the information, um, will be important. My thinking. Um, about subcommittees, again, is that the subcommittee um, uh, could review and consider what they think the best plan is. Um, I believe Mr. Laird has um, clarified to us that if it seems like there's time between then and the next public board meeting, that the subcommittee is free to collect um, some information, which would then go into the discussion for the next public um, board meeting. Or um, if there's not, the subcommittee could simply bring its findings and suggestions um, for um, priorities or additional um, process um, to the board for the next public board meeting. Um, and you know, uh, in terms of the right way to go about it, I certainly agree with you on that. And your second well, point? Well, I guess it, it that also depends on item fourteen. What the cadence of our meetings are, and, and um, you know, if we're meeting monthly, that's one thing. If we're meeting quarterly, that's another. Um, 
the other is you mentioned um, the perhaps needing another subcommittee to focus on audit um, and risk uh, the risk analysis, uh, uh, which I think makes sense. I mean, in my mind, I think of kind of five main areas of, that we need to focus on. That's one of them. Um, and then enforcement and how the structure of enforcement um, and approach to enforcement might be another. Um, it's not you know, I, I, I still think the regulatory development and, and developing draft regs is, is got to be super high priority. So maybe those things are, are further down the road, but just wanted to flag that we may well need uh, a subcommittee to look at different models and options for how we do our enforcement work. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I do agree. Um, and it wasn't on the table for this, for, for getting us started because uh, the timelines are different. Um, the Attorney General's office will uh, is enforcing um, the CCPA currently and will be enforcing it um, uh, for the next couple of years. So um, that was the thinking um, uh, that we will definitely need to take that up um, and a subcommittee to look at it will be important, um, but that it was um, uh, given limited time, um, it was something to, to think about in the future. Um, other thoughts and comments? Um, would anyone like to talk about my um, proposed assignments? Or are we going forward that way? Uh, Ms. De La Torre. Um, just a, a short comment that I neglected to make before. Um, for the third subcommittee, I think that one of the important areas that they should advise on as soon as possible is where is the agency going to be located? Because this is very uh, important for the hiring process as well. So perhaps that could be a priority for that um, subcommittee to report on as soon as we meet again. Thank you, Ms. De La Choy. Um, so we have um, things that have come up uh, through the course of the meeting uh, that um, uh, are priorities for the Startup Administration Subcommittee to look at um, include um, what the potential physical location or locations or options um, for the agency would be, um, potentially the handbook, um, taking into account Ms. De La Torre's observation, again, about timelines and resources and priorities, um, as well as uh, any um, uh, agreements that we need to make that um, we haven't discussed or that I don't feel comfortable um, entering into um, without further discussion, um, uh, potentially, um, uh, thinking about some organizational structure issues until the executive director is in place to do that for us, um, if it seems that we need that um, and, and that kind of thing. Mr. Thompson? Um, two things you asked for comments on the, the subcommittee structure and assignments. Um, you know, I think on a, a go forward, I'm comfortable with the, the structure that you've proposed with the caveat that was I think raised by a couple of folks that the, the development and promulgation and drafting of the regulations is core to, to what we're gonna do. And all of us have an interest in, in being a part of that process. So envisioning a, a, a process where that is allocated among multiple subcommittees down the road um, would be my one caveat to that, to that observation. Um, I do think that there's a good point about where the duty station for these jobs is which seems like a barrier to, to posting them. Um, I don't know if it's required as a, as a function of posting a government job that the duty station be clear. Um, wouldn't surprise me if that was a, a requirement of a posting. Um, so are we, and maybe Ms. Garcia can, can answer this, are we delaying our own posting that we've all identified as urgent by not having a, a headquarters location or a duty station for these jobs. Ms. Garcia, are you available to answer the question? I am. So duty statement, yes. Location, not necessarily. You can have it be open because you can explore the options of remote working, for example. Or we can put it broad, just statewide. That okay. is, again, I'm, oh, sorry, one point that is specific to the executive director. And then again, for the 
uh, CEAs as well, you will need a duty statement, but we could at least start the initial process of establishing them with CalHR with a draft duty statement that the board can amend at a later date. Okay, my own observation, I don't think for, if you're gonna be the executive director of the agency, being purely remote is, is really feasible. Um, that's just my own view. Um, I don't know if anybody, maybe we can't talk about this, but I, uh, option, I mean, it seems like there's Sacramento and then there's everywhere else. Those are the choices. Um, and, and sorry, just let me add, and that is specific to the initial advertisement. At least you could have it be open, but then require that the individual be, be located at wherever you define as your final physical location. So Ms. Garcia, is it fair to say our, our tension here is that we don't have a physical location. We can go ahead and post the job, but there may be candidates who would want to know the physical location before they apply for the job. Um, but otherwise we have not much, but a little bit of time um, to be deciding a physical location that we can then discuss with candidates. Yes, absolutely. And so that would obviously come up uh, during the interview process. Right. Okay, I, I guess I struggle to see how we get a good candidate pool if you don't know where the job is. I mean, if I live in Sacramento and the job turns out to be in LA, I'm no longer probably interested. Most, many people are no longer interested in vice versa. Um, I think that that's, that's a, a, a tension um, that, that we're gonna need to deal with relatively quickly. Thank you. Can we decide that today? Do we not have enough information? Um, Ms. Garcia, is, well, uh, the other question is whether we properly agendized um, a decision like that. I don't know if I want to turn it to Phil for that point. But, but again, I would say we can leave it open. And in my experience, we have hired people throughout the state who then ultimately come to Sacramento if that's where we choose their headquarters to be. And then I think another issue though for the board to consider is what the expectation is of the executive director. If you are, for example, located in Sacramento, do you want that individual to be in Sacramento five days a week? Again, I think there's been significant advances in telework, um, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, um, but we all are able to continue to function successfully in a remote environment. So again, more options for you to consider. So you could have someone, for example, in LA, but come to Sacramento three, four days a week. In, in terms of um, being able to discuss sort of location of the position, I mean, I, I suppose if we wanted to consider revisiting agenda item uh, six in terms of hiring strategy, timelines and duties, um, I mean, I do think this somewhat recently falls into a general discussion of sort of this duty statement we've been discussing and, and sort of the parameters of the job um, that were discussed earlier. Um, that said, you know, to the extent the board also feels like more information is needed before they're ready to make a determination on that. Um, to, to Tiffany's point, I think the way the process works, at least as far as I understand it, is um, essentially uh, the board could further refine sort of the requirements of the position at the next stage. Um, if that's how they want to proceed. I'm sorry, just one other option. We could, for example, we could do Sacramento now. Um, and then depending on the candidates that we receive, we could always go back out and re-advertise. So. So I am hearing that for the uh, startup administration subcommittee, um, one of the job number ones um, is sorting out this question of location. The second question would be whether um, whether we do want to revisit the hiring plan discussion um, in order to decide whether to list Sacramento or um, another location. Mr. Lay? Yeah, I think uh, it would be helpful to just, uh, maybe we don't have to come to the decision today, but maybe to just kind of discuss the pros and cons while we can, instead of just putting it all on the on the committee to do it while we're all here, um, that would be my, my recommendation. Mr. Laird, as long as that's co, as long as that's kosher, 
Um, yes, although I might advise that, um, well, I guess it gets a little tricky. Um, I was gonna say to the extent we could um, uh, conclude this agenda item before moving back to the other one, but, um, but you are uh, permitted to take agenda items out of order. So we can um, proceed how, however you see fit. All right. Well, let's see if we can make progress towards concluding this agenda item and then jumping back um, to discuss the location. Ms. Sierra, and then Mr. Lay. Um, I'll wait, because I was going to comment about um, agenda item number six. So I'll, I'll wait till we go back to that item. OK, thank you, Ms. Sierra. Mr. Lay? I just left my hand up. I, I'm, oh, I don't... Okay. All right, wonderful. Um, in, in, in that case, um, uh, I would like to try to sum up what I think, where, where I think we are. Um, my understanding of the conversation um, is that we are there, everyone is broadly okay um, with the, the subcommittee plan that um, folks understand uh, that subcommittees are able to collect information, that the question of how far beyond doing some research and making advice, uh, advising the board um, as to what the next steps are um, uh, for each subcommittee will in part, of course, be informed by the timing of our next meeting. Um, and um, I haven't heard anyone ask to be moved um, from their uh, proposed assignments. Um, I, I do wanna give people an opportunity um, to let me know if it is something um, that is, um, uh, you feel um, you, would, you would prefer um, not to do. Um, and if, if everyone is uh, under sort of general consensus that we can move forward, my understanding is we don't need to, to vote on this. We can go ahead um, and operate um, in subcommittees. Um, uh, but I, I do wanna give everybody again, another chance um, to, to comment before we do move forward. All right. Um, thank, uh, thank you, everybody. Oh, oh Mr. Lay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask about, you know, giving input to, to those, you know, subcommittees. I, I don't necessarily need to be on the regulatory oh, uh, committee. Okay. I am uh, so sorry. This is my fault. I didn't return to you to ask for priorities. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I just think, um, you know, in looking at the regulations and the priority, you know, one thing to really think about is, um, you know, how to make sure that the agency and asking questions right around um, how to make sure the agency just doesn't consider privacy in a vacuum, but like what happens to that privacy afterwards, um, you know, in terms of how it's used to, to discriminate uh, and like algorithmic bias. And then uh, to those points, you know, priorities for me would definitely be the, um, the talk about, uh, you know, impact assessments um, for high risk industries. You know, that's, a, that's an issue that I work on quite a bit. Um, and then the audit requirements, right? Who, who's subject to the audit? Um, so I think those are things that if we, get, we need to get the ball rolling on quickly so companies know that you know, they have potential requirements. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. That is appreciated. I would now like to request any public comment. Mr. Joseph Pinero, is there a public comment? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, it looks like we may have one public comment. Uh, as a reminder, if uh, anyone else would like to make a public comment, please uh, raise your hand in your meeting window or press star nine if you're connected by telephone. Um, so we have uh, Sherry Parth Rockwell. If you have a comment, you have three minutes. Hi, um, this is Sherry Porath Rockwell, and I'm a privacy lawyer at Sidley Austin in Los Angeles. But I'm making this comment as um, my position as acting chair of the privacy law section of the California Lawyers Association. Um, many of you know, and some of you may not know, that the um, California Lawyers Association is the bar association for all California lawyers. Um, so the members of our section are the data privacy and security lawyers who work in a variety of settings where law firms, advocacy, advocacy groups, in-house counsel, healthcare settings, cybersecurity firms, 
you name it. And we are the consumers of CCPA regs and also the regs you will be developing. So um, in my capacity as chair of this section, I wanna offer you our help. Um, we can reach a lot of people, we're good at it. Um, the organization is well equipped to um, broadcast messages to, to thousands of the lawyers. Um, and so I just wanna offer our assistance to the subcommittee um, to facilitate any of the preliminary rulemaking activities, backfinding, or, or whatever you think could be helpful. Um, we are here to support the board and the agency. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rockwell. Are there further public comments? Uh, I do not see any more public comments at this Thank time. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Panero. Um, are we ready to circle back to agenda item number six, Mr. Thompson? And then Ms. Sierra. Is there any chance we could have a five minute break before going back to the oh, other item? Um, absolutely, would others like a five minute break? In fact, if anybody asks for a break, we should just take a break. Um, so um, let's take a, a 10 minute break um, and reconvene at uh, 3.38 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and we will um, we'll now go into recess, thank you. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, we will now resume our session. Mr. Joseph Pinero, could you please uh, call the, do the roll call for us? Certainly, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Ms. De La Torre. Present. Mr. Light. Present. Ms. Sierra. Present. Mr. Thompson. Present. And Chairperson Urban. Present. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. We have a quorum and we will continue with our business. We have decided to circle back to agenda item number six, initial hiring strategy, timeline and duties um, to discuss some details that have come up later in the day, um, specifically the location of the position. Um, Ms. Sierra, um, you had a comment. Yes, thank you. So it's, it seems to me it'd be really helpful for us to see if we have a consensus and kind of the direction we want to go um, as to location or multiple locations. And, you know, even though we need to do some research and find out are there any constraints in having multiple offices or not, um, it would be great just to kind of get a sense from all of us as to our initial thoughts on this. Um, my feeling is that, you know, as I understand it, given our budget, will be, or the agency will be employing approximately 50 or so staff members. I think I saw that figure in um, some of the materials. And, you know, given that they are going to, the agency has a um, enforcement mission, it seems to me that it would be very helpful to have offices in multiple locations if we can do that and have at least a Southern California and a Northern California presence. And, you know, rather than having everybody centralized in one office, because as we've seen through telecommuting and through the 
quarantine that people can work pretty effectively in different locations and there would be opportunity to travel within the state um, when necessary. So if we were able to, you know, my initial thought is, you know, we want to get the most talented person in this executive director position as possible. And I would hate to limit it because of geographics. And I would think that if we would be probably most able to do that, if we could advertise it, if we don't know the cities yet, at least statewide, and be thinking about having, you know, at least Northern and Southern California, maybe it's Sacramento, maybe an office in the Bay Area, maybe an office in Los Angeles, um, as, as kind of the direction we're moving to see if that's possible versus advertising it in one city. But, you know, there's pros and cons of having everybody centralized in one office um, versus multiple offices. But I think, again, it's large enough and given their mandate, I think it could be very helpful to have folks in different parts of the state. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Other comments? Mr. Thompson? Um, uh, an observation that when we're starting up, and I apologize for the, if you hear noise outside, um, I think an existing operation can work remotely with less loss of efficiency or loss of connectivity than a new entity. And that a new entity, to some extent, you need to familiarize yourself with, with your colleagues in order to work most effectively and develop kind of a, an organizational culture and, and an organizational culture. Um, so I, I agree that remote work during COVID has changed the, the dynamics somewhat. I, I think we need to be sensitive to the fact that we are a new entity and our staff will be new to each other and that they need they will need some time together to, to get accustomed to each other. Um, I don't know, I, I had, I'll just be blunt, I had always assumed this thing would be headquartered in Sacramento. Um, that's the seat of government, it makes sense to me. Um, it's proximate to most of the Bay Area. I mean, you can take a train or a relatively short drive. Um, one north, one south makes some sense to me, particularly since I live in LA. Um, that sounds appealing. So, you know, maybe headquartering it in LA makes sense. Um, but I, I don't know if uh, Ms. Garcia's suggestion is workable for us. I, I do think um, having a duty station, a location is a necessary piece of information, particularly uh, for a job like this. Um, I, I, think it, I think it's helpful to know where the job is uh, and that's gonna drive the pool to some extent. And um, her suggestion, as I recall, was to list it as Sacramento unless we change it later. Um, I'm comfortable with that. I always, um, perhaps because I always assumed it would be in Sacramento, uh, just because that makes logical sense to me. Um, so th that that's kind of that's that's my view on it. We we haven't touched on this, and I did some looking last night and couldn't really find an an absolute number. Is there a maximum salary or salary range that jobs like this go into? Um, I don't know if there's a maximum state salary um, or kind of a benchmark of other similarly situated jobs uh, because that, and I, I don't know if there's locality pay. If it's X and it's X plus 10% of it in the Bay Area, you know, is that going to be enough for somebody in the Bay Area given the cost differentials? Those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, salary does have to be approved by CalHR. Uh, Ms. Garcia, would you mind expanding a little bit uh, for Mr. Thompson on the board? Sure, yes, absolutely. So Kelly Char, as Chairperson Urban said, is approved by um, the Department of Human Resources. And so um, just some initial groundwork we did is we did an analysis, as in my BCSH um, in correspondence with the chair, uh, an analysis of similar sized entities. And so what we're looking in terms of salary range is between uh, 11,000 and 14,000 a month. Um, and what CalHR, so the lower end would be 132 annually, for example, I see you doing the math um, in your head. Um, so they look at the size of the organization, for example, as you noted, roughly, or, and I'm sorry, 
uh, board member Sierra said approximately 50 people. To be honest, I don't know. And I would just also note that you can grow to the extent that you need to. And that would just be a process with the Department of Finance and the legislature. Sorry to get in the weeds on that. Um, but you can be larger than $10,000 budget um, or 10 million. Um, so yes, again, size of the entity, so number of people, the size of your budget and the scope and complexity of your work are all factors that CalHR will consider when making that initial salary determination for the executive director. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lay? Yeah, um, you know, I, I actually also thought this would be in Sacramento, but, you know, as we talked about it more and more, you know, I was thinking, you know, this is a brand new agency. And, you know, I, having worked in a lot of administrative agencies, um, you know, I can see us like taking a different direction. You know, uh, there's a lot of new research out there about how to best do hybrid work and, you know, still build culture. Um, and you know, I it's really out of my expertise because you know those are those are things that maybe the the ED or whoever the deputy could be we might might have better answers to that. But um, you know, in terms of the options, right? It's like Sacramento. I, I I see that as an important place because of the ED and the need to be close to um, you know the legislative action that may may determine a lot about uh, you know what gets added to the. The CPPA, um, but I also say, you know, um, the, the CPUC is kind of has a multiple office model. They're headquartered in SF. They have uh, offices in LA and Sacramento. Um, so, you know, I think I think that that approach could work. Um, just assuming there's like a head office somewhere, and you know, most of tech the tech industry that would be you know subject to this, they're they're mostly located in, in the Bay Area. So I could also see from the enforcement side of things. Um, you know, the need for, for that proximity um, and maybe having hearings there to the extent they need to be in person um, as kind of just a, a convenient um, location. But, you know, that's all I have to say is, you know, there's a lot of options. I don't think we're, it doesn't seem like we're going to get building a consensus today, but, um, you know, I, I kind of am warming up to the multiple office model. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. De La Torre? Thank you. So uh, just, I wanted to share a couple of things. Um, the first one is just from a very kind of <clears throat> initial uh, realistic perspective. I imagine we are gonna be renting a space at a building that's a public building. And uh, in terms of availability of those, um, that could be quite limited. I don't know where, you know where we are with doing research on that, but after we do that initial research, it might be that we realistically have you know five six actual possibilities to to discuss as opposed to just like a universe of, of different options um, so I think it will be really really helpful to get that information as soon as possible you know what um, uh, space is available to be rented um, effective immediately uh, and then the second thing that I wanted to bring to the attention of the board because this is something that it is the reality in many other um, similar agencies in other countries. Um, and we have to be aware of it is that the, uh, and I think some of the comments prior to my comment touched upon this, um, the private market pays much more than what we will be able to pay to our staff. And I think it is highly likely and it is typically the case for other similar agencies that there's a lot of churn in, ter in terms of the staff because they are offer you know very um very good positions potentially so i think again being very realistic we should look at a market where our um our ability to compensate um, the staff allows them to have a, a good standard um for their lives and i think that probably the bay area will be excluded <laughs> on that um, kind of um, uh, approach, not to say that we maybe we don't have, want to have a satellite um, office in San Francisco, as uh, Mrs. Sierra pointed out, but to look for a main location where our salary um, can actually be something that our staff feels comfortable with will be, I think, on the long term, a really good approach. Thank you, Ms. De La Troy. I would also say, I think we have the opportunity to um, 
create a structure that is um, uh, as widely accessible to Californians as possible. Um, and location or locations can be a component of that as well. Um, in terms of um, how we move forward with this discussion, let me back up. I, um, I'd like to offer um, one additional um, thought of my own that is connected to thoughts that others have, have um, offered, which is that I have trouble um, seeing a successful executive director of this agency um, who is not available to go to Sacramento on a regular basis at the least. Um, so maybe one of the things, regardless of where the agency is headquartered, we could um, communicate would be that um, there will certainly be business in Sacramento coordinating with the attorney general's office, coordinating, um, I'm thinking of coordinating uh, the legislature, which was already mentioned. Um, and it might be helpful for um, candidates to at least have that understanding and expectation, um, even if ultimately um, our office is located or an office, main office is located elsewhere. Um, so that, that's simply a, a thought and an opinion. As far as how we move forward, um, I have a little bit of trouble um, thinking how to formulate any kind of a decision until we have more information about what is possible, um, both the actual real estate that might be available, as Ms. Sierra mentioned, and also what that actually looks like in terms of our budget. Um, $10 million is um, a, um, um, is uh, really exciting. Um, it is the most the state has allocated to a purpose such as this, um, but it is pretty limited, particularly in the state of California. So um, I, I think that we probably need to take some advice um, within the administration subcommittee um, and have um, perhaps a more considered um, set of advice and options for the board um, as soon as we can get that. Um, and also, as Ms. Garcia pointed out, there's the initial um, decision and sort of where we initially start um, with the understanding that down the road, um, there may be the possibility um, for expansion. Um, with all of that said, um, I, um, I'm wondering how the board would like to choose to move forward. Um, should we um, list Sacramento provisionally um, should we not list a location, but make clear that we think that um, the executive director at least would need to spend time in Sacramento? Um, would we like to um, would we like to pursue another option? Mr. Thompson. Uh, I would list Sacramento provisionally uh, as subject to change. Thank you. I believe Mr. Lay already expressed that opinion, but um, does that still stand? Ms. Sierra? Well, you know, I think given the comments, and, and I think I will still be you know, suggesting that there'll be an expansion of, of the um, geographic locations, but to get us started, since there does seem to be consensus that at, at a minimum, Sacramento would be a, um, a you know, a very reasonable and, and very likely headquarters that that may make sense to move forward, at least so there's clarity to the candidates um, who may wish to apply. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Are there further comments? Ms. Garcia, um, is this, it would, would sort of a provisional, provisionally listing Sacramento um, and communicating that we would be discussing this with candidates, is that a workable path forward or do we need something more concrete? We can absolutely do that in the job posting and make note of that for the candidates, yes. Thank you. Um, and I, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Sierra, did you have yeah, I, have, I have one more thought. And this is um, a question for Tiffany. You know, in, in job postings um, for the state, I often seen like if you're looking to hire at a certain level, we note that, but saying may also consider, you know, other levels. 
Is there a way to do that for a geographic that might also consider um, like Los Angeles or it, Oakland? Yeah. Yes, if the board would like, you could put numerous locations. So for example, there are times when we put multiple counties. Mm -hmm. So not specific to various levels because we do need the level of the executive director, this exempt position as established mm -hmm. in statute once Cal HR creates the class code. So that piece doesn't work, but in terms of location, we could put multiple that we would consider. But we could also, then you could put a priority of Sacramento. Sacramento, but may also consider could do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the problem is we don't even know if we have the ability or we just don't have enough research, it seems, to put much with much certainty at this point. And, and then how often can, or when can we amend the, um, the ad then if we were to include more cities? Let's say we start with Sacramento and then after we do research, we, we decide, you know what, let's add an additional city. So then that goes to the issue of if you'd like to do a job posting that's open until filled, or if you actually put a deadline on the application. So as I mentioned earlier, it's typically 10 days. There is an option to extend um, for another an additional five days. Um, but then once that closes, then you would want to review all the application score. And then from that, depending on the scoring and everything, either you do interviews or you go, would go out again and advertise. So... I'm sorry, it just, yeah, how you would like to structure that initial posting. Okay, thank you. So I don't, oh, excuse me, that's... One of the joys of remote work, everyone gets to meet one another's pets and children and, and so forth. Um, Ms. Hira, I, I'm sorry, did you get cut off? Was there more that you would like to add? No, I mean, just, you know, this is a, a tough question, but it seems like, again, the consensus seems like a minimum Sacramento, maybe that's the simplest way to proceed and do it with a date certain, and then we'll re-review and see where we're at. Maybe I'm Thank comfortable you. with that. Yeah. And uh, to end, again, I think, I think uh, the subcommittee has clear direction um, to, to work out some more detailed information for the board um, on this topic. Um, all right. Um, are we ready to move forward with Sacramento as a provisional with the understanding that it might be amended um, as we have discussed? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure we need a motion and an action item on that, um, but please raise your hand if you would like. Okay. Um, uh, we should um, check to see if there is public comment. Um, uh, Mr. Joseph Pinero, is there is there public comment? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I don't see any public comments at this time, but if you'd like to make a comment, uh, please press the raised hand icon on your meeting window or press star nine on your telephone. You give just a moment for that. And I'm not seeing any comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. In that case, um, we will move to the next item on the agenda before we circle back to agenda item number six, uh, which is the notice to the Attorney General to assume rulemaking authority. Um, at this point in the meeting, I would also like to suggest that we take items um, somewhat out of order so that we um, discuss the uh, item number 11 um, as it is set in the agenda and then um, talk about the future meeting schedule, um, as that has been deeply connected to all of the other things that we've been discussing in the last um, couple of hours. And I just wanted to give the public a heads up that we might take that out of order so they can make decisions about coming and going in the meeting. Um, all right, so we are um, now turning to agenda item number 11. Um, a very exciting uh, agenda item, if I could editorialize slightly, um, which is um, the um, need to provide notice to the Attorney General of the agency's assumption of rulemaking responsibilities. I will give a little bit of background um, on this agenda item, and then I will open it up for discussion. In order for the California Privacy Protection Agency to undertake its statutorily mandated rulemaking work, authority to adopt regulations under the California Consumer Privacy Act must be transferred from the Attorney General to the agency. 
Now, as we have discussed through the day with Mr. Laird, there are um, plenty of information gathering tasks we can undertake. Um, we can work on um, drafts of regulations, but there is a point at which authority must be transferred um, before the um, CC, uh, excuse me, the CPPA can move forward with rulemaking. Um, in, uh, for authority to transfer, we must provide notice to the Attorney General. Um, section 1798.185D of the California Consumer Privacy Act as amended by the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020 states that beginning the later of July 1st, 2021 or six months after the agency provides notice to the Attorney General that it is prepared to begin rulemaking under this title, the authority assigned to the Attorney General to adopt regulations under this section shall be exercised by the California Privacy Protection Agency. Now, there is another provision, section 1798.199.40B, subsection B, um, which states on and after the earlier of July 1st, 2021, or within six months of the agency providing the Attorney General was noticed that it is prepared to assume rulemaking responsibilities under this title, adopt, amend, rescind regulations pursuant to section 1798.185 to carry out the purposes and provisions of the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, including regulations, um, et cetera. There's a little bit more detail than that. Um, so the first is about the transfer of the rulemaking authority directly. The second is embedded within the responsibilities of the agency. Um, the um, uh, advice that I've received is that both the intent and um, the likely um, clear meaning, or at least the likely meaning, is that um, uh, it is the later of July 1st, 2021, or six months after we give notice um, when the authority can transfer. Um, in the event of doubt, um, the legislature um, has been working on Assembly Bill number 694, um, which would amend that second passage that I read to say on and after the later of July 1st, 2021, or within six months of the agency providing the Attorney General with notice. Um, I checked the status of the bill this morning. Um, it has passed the Assembly. Um, it has been read, oh shoot, once or twice um, in the Senate and is currently a Judiciary Committee in the Senate. Um, these are technical fixes to the bill, so um, I anticipate um, that the legislature will likely pass the bill and the governor will sign it into law, removing any ambiguity. Um, what all of this means is that um, in order for us to begin a six-month clock after which we will um, uh, have authority transferred to us to undertake rulemaking, um, we need to agree um, to provide a notice to the Attorney General to that effect. Um, so that is the purpose of um, this agenda item, um, whether the board is ready to provide notice to the Attorney General um, to this effect. And if so, um, then um, I will follow up um, immediately with the letter to the Attorney General, letting him know um, that we are giving notice. Um, and six months from the date of that letter, um, the rulemaking authority will transfer to us. Are there questions or comments from the board? Yes, Mr. Thompson. So six months from now, call that December, mid-December. Um, would we, pardon, say that again? December 14th or 15th. Okay. Um, so going back to Mr. Laird's presentation on the Administrative Procedures Act, the first step is so, uh, providing the draft package. I'm trying to pull up the presentation so I've got the terminology correct. Um, the notice package submitted to OAL. So until six months from that notice have elapsed, can we not submit the notice package to OAL because we don't have the authority? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? That is my understanding. <laughs> Mr. Laird, could you please uh, clarify for us? Yes, and actually, um, I, I, I think it's a little bit different. Um, 
it's, uh, you, you have to have the authority to promulgate the regulations when it comes down to actually adopting the regulations. And I've seen the Office of Administrative Law in the past allow an agency to start notice, uh, to give that notice uh -huh. that they're starting the public rulemaking process. So um, you you have the ability to issue a notice in, in my, my opinion uh, tomorrow if you had regulations ready to go. What you wouldn't be able to do is then after that 45 days has lapsed, adopt those regulations and submit for final approval to OAL because then OAL would say, this agency doesn't have the authority to promulgate these regulations yet because that six months hasn't lapsed. Um, so in talking with the chair about this, um, you, you know, at least from my chair, it would seem that uh, uh, making it clear that you have this authority as soon as possible will make it so that there's no timeline issues when you're ready to submit those, um, uh, which will likely be, you know, closer to next spring than this coming December. But again, uh, you know, the earlier you get that authority, the, the less problems I think you'll run into. Is there, so it seems like there could be ambiguity there. Um, is there any downside to issuing now? I mean, I'm working, and maybe we need to talk about this in, in some other context or some other forum. I'm working off the assumption that we should have our draft regulations circa January of next year in order to meet all of the deadlines and allow for some wiggle room so that we meet the, the July deadline. That's my own, I, I just, I conceived of that. It may not be grounded in fact. So if, is there any downside to us issuing the notice to the attorney general now? I don't believe so. And it would be my recommendation to, to proceed now. Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm not sure that we have an answer for this question, but um, my understanding from reading CPRE is that and my expectation was that um, the AG will actually start the rulemaking process, but at least publicly, there's not been any um, indication that they have done so. Do we know if they have internally worked towards starting a process, um, identified staff or you know, structure things that we're kind of trying to do on our own? Um, I, I'm asking this question for two reasons. One is that to the extent that they have done that work, perhaps it's work that we can benefit from. Um, and then uh, the second one is because the law says that the agency is to notify when it is ready to assume rulemaking. And I'm not sure that we can honestly state right now that we are ready to assume rulemaking when we haven't even hired um, the executive director. Um, so, so we really, I think one way or another have to rely on, on the AG to at least start the process. Um, do, you, do we have answers to those two questions where they have done anything on their own and in terms of, you know, to what degree we can actually state right now that we're ready to assume the obligation? Thank you, Ms. De La Choy. I do not know um, of information about whether the Attorney General um, is, is proceeding or is planning to proceed to start the rulemaking. Um, my understanding is they are expecting us to um, go ahead and give them notice, but of course it's up to us um, to give them notice. Um, to your sort of more to your sort of substantive concern um, about um, the agency being ready and when it's ready. Um, Mr. Laird, could you advise us um, on, on that point? Um, uh, Ms. De La Torre makes a good makes a good point that what we are notifying the Attorney General of is, 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 is readiness. Um, and at the same time, um, of course, we do have to uh, make sure that the authority is transferred um, uh, in time for us to be able to meet our statutory deadlines um, for the rulemaking? Um, it's a good question and an interesting one because the truth is you don't traditionally see hands off of authority like this uh, uh, in the law, uh, traditionally in connection with a lot of our other rulemaking bodies. Um, I will also say, at least in my conversations with staff from the Attorney General's office, um, 
they have not commenced rulemaking in this space. And um, it's my understanding that they did so knowing very well that um, this agency was taking over jurisdiction of these regulations and they didn't think it would be prudent to start a process that maybe this board completely disagreed with. Um, that said, um, you know, I, I haven't checked in with them more recently. So, you know, uh, uh, I don't wanna speak for the attorney general's office, but just to relay at least my, my conversations with them. Um, and then furthermore, um, in terms of um, sort of readiness for rulemaking, I think the complexity here is you have the balance of, uh, of uh, what someone may or may not deem to be ready for rulemaking against what is a pretty firm deadline to have these regulations in place. Um, now, in terms of um, what sort of the consequences are of either option, uh, that obviously um, depends on which course you take, but in I, I, either option, I, I guess my point is if we don't notify uh, that we're uh, ready to take on rulemaking for this agency um, till a later date, I suppose if at some point that authority lapses beyond July 1st and no regulations are in place by July 1st, then um, the statutory deadline has not been met to, to promulgate these regulations. Um, Again, it's an interesting thing when you have a, a deadline like that in statute and especially this kind of handoff. Um, so um, I, I suppose though the, the idea is that uh, this agency is the one that will have ongoing sort of author primary authority and enforcement with these regulations you're developing. Um, so I, I think at least that's been the idea was that um, uh, you'll hopefully be the ones uh, taking control of, of, of the rulemaking um, going forward, um, but uh, understanding the staffing limitations, I know those are hard, hard requirements to balance. Um, I don't, otherwise I, I can't say I have much more uh, advice besides, um, I think the charge uh, ideally is that uh, this body would be able to assume rulemaking uh, quickly and, and be able to uh, promulgate or attempt to promulgate by that July 1st deadline uh, regulations as required. And Mr. Lake, just to be, perfectly clear. You mean July 1st, 2022? That yes. Day. Yes. Apologies. Um, I have a follow-up question, but I would like Ms. De La Torre to have the opportunity to follow up if she would like. Right. Uh, I mean, the other thing is the, um, I, I'm really glad to hear from Chairman Urban that um, Sacramento is working on kind of um, making this law a little bit more clear on the deadline because we have to separate provisions that have different language, um, but uh, you know, the way it is right now, it's, it's, it's fairly unclear as to whether July 1st, we will assume um, rulemaking authority, no matter whether we notify or not. Um, at least that's what one of the provisions of the law says. And um, the, the second piece is, that it seems that maybe, I mean, it seems to me logical that we should have a conversation with the AG before notifying them. But I, perhaps that conversation has been had already. It's just that I'm not, you know, I was not aware of it. Um, it's just um, whatever process helps us expedite the rulemaking is the process that I will prefer. And if that were to leave the authority with the AG for a few months so that they can kick off the initial gathering of information, um, I will prefer that option. It doesn't sound like that's what they're planning on doing um, from what I hear. Um, but I guess that's, that, that will be my preference um, to just follow the process that helps us expedite the rulemaking. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I, the, the only, the end, I don't, I, as Mr. Laird said, I, I don't wanna speak for the attorney general's office. Um, uh, I have had a brief conversation um, uh, with the team who did the original rulemaking. My um, understanding is that they are expecting us to go ahead um, and um, give them notice that uh, uh, so that the authority will transfer. Um, I, I can't say for certain um, if they were intending um, to start the process um, but I have not had any indications that they are. Um, it is certainly something that we could follow up on. Um, one option would be for the regulation subcommittee 
um, to be sure to connect with the Attorney General's office um, and um, verify exactly what their part of the timeline is. Um, I would like um, us to be sure if that is what we chose to do, um, to consider two things. Um, one is the timing of our next public meeting um, so that we aren't putting off the six month clock, the beginning of the six month clock too long. And then secondly, that we do feel comfortable um, that we don't have to um, uh, agree to provide notice by July 1st, 2021. Um, the ambiguity in the statute is there. Um, it looks as though um, it won't be there um, forever, but currently, um, currently it is still there. So I think I would like us all to um, uh, review with Mr. Laird the second language, the earlier of language, and just make sure um, that we're comfortable that um, we are uh, following um, what we're required to do under the statute. Um, and this may, I, I think it's, I think it's fine, um, but I would like us to be sure that we look at it um, closely. Any further comments before um, I ask Mr. Laird to walk that through with us? Yes, Ms. Sierra. Um, you know, and one other piece, and, and maybe this goes um, to Ms. De La Torre's point, is by the next meeting, we should have a better sense of like how much outside help we can get staffing you know, in working on these regulations, if that's going to be possible, you know, because as you know, the, you know, the attorney general's office or other state agencies, they have all have a lot on their plates. I mean, there may be some real, you know, limitations on, on how much staffing we can contract for to assist us. Um, and we don't really know that piece yet of how much assistance we're going to have. Thank you. We will have to give notice um, either way. Um, Ms. Delatory's point about you know saying we're ready <laughs> um, is, is a very good one. Um, and I think we should carefully consider how it works out with the timeline. Um, Mr. La Laird, um, with apologies, could we, could we bring you back on um, just to double check on that section of the CPRA that reads on or after the earlier of July 1st, 2021, or within six months of the agency providing the attorney general with notice, um, uh, et cetera. Um, that provision um, has as its second half that on or after that date, the agency will adopt, amend, et cetera. Um, it, the, um, of course, the agency would need authority um, in order to adopt regulations. Um, but I guess my question is, is there anything that could be triggered on July 1st of this year that we should be aware of if we do, if we decide to hold over the notice to the Attorney General for our next meeting in order to allow for more coordination with the Attorney General's office? Um, I'm not aware of anything additionally that would be triggered, right? I think at the end of the day, the risk is in the inconsistency you've pointed out, right? That perhaps. Um, if that were to be the controlling interpretation, then actually you've assumed rulemaking authority on July 1st, whether you were ready to or not, uh, essentially. Um, but that doesn't, the, the only risk there would be then um, if the Attorney General's office were to attempt to somehow promulgate and complete and adopt further regulations after that date and somebody were to make the opposing claim that they did not have the authority to do that at that time because of this alternative interpretation. But Given the bill that you mentioned earlier, Chair, um, as well as um, uh, um, the, the, the other provision that, that sort of stands at conflict, um, uh, to me, the, 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 what will happen if once you give the no notice to the Attorney General's office and six months has passed, then both dates have occurred and there will be certainty no matter what the interpretation that you at that point have rulemaking authority. So that would be um, sort of the benefit of providing that notice. But to your point, um, unless we expect, and, and I tend to agree with uh, uh, board member Thompson's comments about timing, um, 
unless you expect it to be adopting regulations by January, um, you know, we're, we're, we'd only be pushing off that authority by a month. Um, so I don't think it would it would have an impact necessarily on the board's uh, preliminary activities over the next six months. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Assuming our next meeting is in approximately um, approximately a month, but I, Good point. I think um, your response to Mr. Thompson stands as to um, our freedom to operate um, even before the authority transfers up into the point that we adopt the regulations. Um, so um, given, given all of this um, conversation, um, summarizing the board's discussion um, a bit, um, there is the, um, the, there is a requirement that we will um, at some point need to sort of give notice to the attorney general um, that we will be, that we are ready um, to engage in rulemaking and that we will be accepting authority um, six months after that um, notice authority uh, will transfer to us. There is some ambiguity um, in the current statute um, as to the question of whether uh, this is the earlier of July 1st or six months after or the later. Um, there is a bill um, moving through the legislature um, uh, that is, a, um, uh, among other things, uh, um, intended to fix that ambiguity in favor of later. We are able to go ahead and move forward with information gathering, drafting regulations, putting together the package, um, uh, um, and a, a number of things um, under the um, requirements for rulemaking, um, uh, but we can't go ahead and adopt the regulations. So um, there is an argument um, that we do have some time uh, before we need to get the six month clock started. Um, and one thing that we could do with that time um, would be for the regulations um, subcommittee to explore with the attorney general's office more about the attorney general's office's plans, um, any plans for regulation um, or not, um, any staffing, um, uh, um, any uh, possibilities for helping us with staffing um, and that sort of thing. Um, are there additional comments or um, have I summarized that appropriately? All right, um, thanks to all of the board members for the discussion. In that case, um, uh, listening um, to the conversation of the board, I propose that we do not take an action item on this, um, uh, this um, item of the agenda um, and um, assume that we will take it up again um, once we have more information with the caveat that we do need to discuss when we might hold our next board meeting. Um, and so I'd like to leave open the option for the board to choose to circle back to this agenda item um, if we feel that we need to. I would now like to ask for public comment. Mr. Joseph Pinero, is there any public comment? Thank you, Chairperson. As a reminder, if you'd like to make a public comment, uh, please press the raised hand in your meeting window or uh, press star nine on your telephone. Uh, it looks like we have one comment right now from uh, Shoaib Mohammed. You have three minutes to make your comment. Thank you, uh, Evan and uh, Chairperson and Board Members. Uh, my name is Shweb Mohammed. I'm a policy advocate with the, with the California Chamber of Commerce. I uh, lead on issues of uh, privacy and cybersecurity policy. And uh, I just want to start by saying congratulations on all of your appointments and uh, for inaugurating this new agency. Um, on behalf of our uh, over 14,000 members uh, who employ over 25% of the private sector workforce in California, I just want to take this chance to introduce Cal Chamber uh, and our privacy coalition to this board and to say we really look forward to working together with you on a whole host of complex issues that we're, we're going to address in the years to come. Uh, historically, the Cal Chamber has appreciated a respectful, collaborative, and inclusive relationship uh, with our state legislator, uh, fellow stakeholders, the Attorney General's Office, and uh, we, of course, look forward to enjoying the same inclusive uh, relationship with this honorable board as well. Uh, as you assume your duties, uh, we also wanted to extend our appreciation uh, to the former Attorney General uh, Bacera for his efforts uh, to maximize stakeholder input by engaging in a preliminary rulemaking process. Uh, as Mr. Laird and the board here touched on earlier this morning, as part of that process, the AG's office solicited public comments 
and held uh, public forums to provide uh, a wide variety of stakeholders the opportunity to provide meaningful input in advance of putting pen to paper to draft regulations. And uh, we, we did believe such a preliminary rulemaking process was uh, invaluable. Uh, as you know, the California Consumer Privacy Act and the CPRA of 2020 incorporate complex issues of first impression in our state. Uh, we look forward to an opportunity to provide this board with our expertise and our input uh, at the start of this process to support your efforts. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be heard here today. We congratulate you on successfully inaugurating this new exciting agency and look forward to working with each of you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I apologize, Mr. Joseph Tenero. And I'm not seeing any other uh, public comments at this time. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Um, and if the board does not have further comments on this issue at this time, um, then we will move to the next agenda item. We will be taking uh, the next agenda item out of order um, for everyone um, uh, to be able to follow along. We are going to move to what is listed on the agenda as item number 14, the future meeting schedule of the board. Um, uh, again, understanding that board members have limited time and also understanding that we have a substantial amount of business before us, um, I propose that we ask staff to help us set up a schedule of approximately monthly meetings for now, um, with the understanding that the next meeting may shift a little bit. Um, I am aware that it is summer um, uh, and that we will need to have everybody's schedules um, wrangled, but my proposal would be that our goal um, would be to meet monthly, understanding that this is not, um, this is not a standing decision but that this would be um, as we are working to, um, to develop the agency. Um, and with that, I will open it up to comments and questions from the board. Mr. Thompson? I agree with your proposal. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Are there comments and questions from the board? Mr. Lay. Yeah, I, I just, uh, you know, I second that a monthly seems to make sense. Uh, are we trying to set aside the date now or are we just uh, deciding that we want to meet monthly? Yes, just deciding that we want to meet monthly so that Ms. Mershi and her staff know how to try to find the appropriate time. Um, Ms. Sierra? I, I agree with the proposal as well. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Ms. De La Torre? I agree as well. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, Mr. Laird, I apologize to keep um, re returning to you, but I, this is not something on which we need a voted action item, I don't think, although we can. Uh, no, no, for, th for this, we can just start noticing them on a monthly basis and, and uh, that will self-execute. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you um, to the board um, for making the time, um, particularly, um, given the season um, to help us get started. And we will proceed um, looking for a meeting time approximately one month from now and assume that we'll um, work on that schedule um, until we decide that we can, um, that we can change the schedule. Uh, Ms. Sierra, did you have further comment? Thank you. Um, before we move from this agenda item, I would like to ask if there's any public comment. Thank you, Chairperson. I'm not seeing any public comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Tenero. Being no public comment um, and um, having consensus on um, our basic meeting schedule, um, I would like to return um, to the um, order of the agenda um, uh, to take uh, agenda item number 12, um, which is public comments um, not on the agenda. This is an opportunity um, for members of the public um, to, um, to comment um, on items that are not on the agenda. Before we proceed with the public comment, um, please do note that the only action the board can take is to listen to comments and consider whether it will discuss the topic at a future meeting. Uh, no other action can be taken on the item at this meeting. Um, so though it may seem at times uh, like the board members are not being responsive, following these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the uh, Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising either the commenter's goals um, 
for the board's mission. Um, with that, um, Mr. Joseph Pinero, um, is there any public comment? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, if anyone would like to make a public comment at this time, uh, please press the raised hand in your meeting window or press star nine if you're connected by telephone only. I don't see any comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Pinero. In that case, we will move um, on to um, agenda item number 13, future uh, agenda items. This is an opportunity for the board to propose agenda items for our next meeting. Um, I am happy to have this agenda item because I don't have to guess without being able to talk with you um, what agenda items we should have um, for our next meeting. Um, I have um, a, a few to begin that I propose. One is um, of course hiring um, any interviews that we are able to put together and potential decisions by the board reports from subcommittees as we have been discussing today. Um, and I have a question for the board um, as to whether you would find valuable future informational presentations. Um, for example, an informational presentation on the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018 and the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020. Um, we of course um, uh, uh, enjoy and um, uh, uh, know this area of law, but they are complicated. Um, and it is certainly possible for us to um, put together an informational presentation on those topics. So there may be other topics that you would like an informational presentation on. So I will start with those three items um, and um, open it up to comments. Um, while you are thinking, I will also be thinking back to our conversation to see if there are further things that we know that we need to add. Ms. I wanted to suggest a couple of items. I apologize, I was trying to pay attention to the ones that you suggested, but I think it's a little late and I don't remember them perfectly. I, I thought they were all very um, uh, acceptable when you mentioned them. I don't personally need an need a informational presentation on any specific topic, but, but perhaps it will be helpful for other members and we can identify and select topics for that. The two items that I, I will suggest we should add to our next meeting are um, number one, um, what um, forums, um, international conferences have been um, proposed or have we been invited to and, and whether we should attend or not. I know that the um, global um, conference that is held annually uh, by all um, data protection authorities is going to happen in October. And we have been invited. And I think that's something for the board to consider, particularly because it's during COVID and it's in Mexico City. And I'm not sure to what degree you know members will be um, open to attending or not. So that might be a conversation that we want to have. And to the extent that there are other forums where the board has been invited, perhaps we can just create a list of those and discuss whether it makes sense to attend and, and who should um, attend those if that's the case. So that's one item. And then the second item, and I'm not sure where we want to put it in terms of priority, because um, like I mentioned before multiple times, I think that rulemaking should be our number one priority together with the staff in the agency. But one consideration that I think we should discuss at some point is whether it will make sense for California to uh, apply for adequacy with the um, European Union regime under GDPR. Um, there are many considerations that go into whether that is um, possible or not possible. And obviously it's not our decision, but the decision, I suppose, of um, the governor to apply. Um, but um, I think it will go a great deal into easing some of the challenges that we have been having with um, cross-border data transfers. Um, the federal government is working on that as well. So I don't think that we should um, get involved if we are in any way um, derailing the efforts at the federal level. 
But I think it's kind of an all hands on deck situation and to the extent that our participation can be helpful for cross border data transfers um, is something that as a board we should have a conversation about at some point. So I leave it to the chairman uh, to decide whether that's something that you know should be part of the conversation next month or maybe three months from now when we do with more urgent items. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. I thought of another one that I had not yet written down, which is, of course, we will also need to revisit the delegation of authority. Um, so that is something that is that is on the list. Other agenda items that board members would like to propose, Mr. Lay? Yeah, and um, I, I would say for the, um, maybe this is, I guess, better for the committee, but I, I kind of, to the extent possible, get an estimate of like the costs for you know locations, um, you know whether it's Sacramento or LA um, or, or San Francisco, um, that might help uh, inform us and in, in making that decision. And um, you know, in, in a lot of the other boards that I work with, uh, we we help out the executive director at least in in setting um, kind of some ground rules or a kind of a vision statement around this strategic plan. And then the ED generally creates kind of the, 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 plan, the how to implement that strategic plan and that vision. And a lot of that is already in the CCPA, but um, you know, I, I work a lot with the CPUC and they have their strategic directives. So I'm wondering if that could be a good um, action item or, or next item for us on the next agenda is to help provide some direction to the ED on uh, you know, our vision and, and where the strategic plan should go. Thank you, Mr. Lake. Mr. Thompson? Um, a couple of things. This one is just a reminder of a previous action um, from Ms. Garcia or for Ms. Garcia or some somebody else, which is a report, and maybe this will be incorporated in other items, on um, uh, temporary staff availability from the Attorney General or other government agencies. Um, and sorry, it was all how the Attorney General is staffing this function. Um, how many people, what levels, um, you know, they, they have been promulgating regulations. It'd be good to know how, how many people they have on it. Are those people full-time or part-time? Um, that, that could give us a rough order of magnitude of the you know, person hours required for this function. Um, separately, um, this is uh, perhaps a question from Mr. Laird, uh, if, if necessary. On the hiring process, um, my recollection is personnel is one area in which we can have closed sessions. Can we have a closed session, a, a closed only meeting? Um, meaning, I mean, maybe we begin an open session and then go into closed session, but you know, kind of in the interim. So if we're going to meet a month from now, um, we can't discuss resumes or candidates or anything until that point. But you know, if the if the thing if the job is posted, it may make sense for us to start talking about the pool prior to the meeting where maybe we're narrowing. I I just don't know if that's an option for us to have an interim closed meeting just on that subject. Um, it's a it's a great question, uh, Mr. Thompson, and, and uh, your intuition is correct on all of this. Um, you can, in fact, have a meeting that's exclusively uh, closed session items. However, actually, as you kind of guessed, um, the requirement would be that you open the meeting meeting in a public uh, setting, um, and then you would uh, immediately adjourn into closed session um, for any sort of closed session discussions. And, and I've seen that done routinely, even for things like you discussed, um, when there is sort of a specific task before the board that they want to dedicate to a, a day to, or, or, or something to that effect. Um, so to comply with Bagley Keene, it would still require that 10 day notice. And it would require that, you know, a personnel decisions about the executive director are being discussed in closed session, uh, open the meeting in open session, and then adjourn into closed session, um, uh, to conduct the meeting of that sort. Thank you, Mr. Laird. So if I'm understanding correctly, um, if we are able to meet in about a month um, and we're sort of in 
uh, at the point where we have a, a pool of applicants um, and maybe sort of a first cut, but we don't have interviews, um, we could, um, uh, we, I could request the board to um, enter into a closed session to, to talk that through and add sort of an, another layer of board discussion. Th th that's correct, although you can also have it as a separate meeting, I, I suppose, is, is the point as well. So you can do it in either format where you either have a regular meeting with other agendized items and then at some point adjourn to closed session to discuss things like personnel, um, or you might decide that's a topic that we want to get to sooner, or maybe in two weeks. And so we'd, we'd post a noblest notice for that in four days, then that meeting could be held in two weeks and it would just be a closed session meeting uh, to discuss personnel. Great, thank you, Mr. Laird. Um, yeah, I was thinking there are multiple steps that we're going to need to take. And if we're meeting every month, which I think is a great idea, if there's two steps, that's two months from now. So we may want to have some intervening meeting either to narrow the pool or for us to, I don't know if we're talking about a group interview or one-on-one, -on -one, a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews to compare notes on how we rated the candidates. Just, I don't want us to have to hew to an every monthly cadence and then burn a lot of time um, we, because that's such a high priority item. Thank you, understood. Um, I will also add, um, Revisiting the notice to the Attorney General to assume rulemaking authority. Um, Mr. Lay? Yeah, I, I mean, I think assuming we get this posted relatively quickly, um, I, I wonder how many applications uh, you know, we'll get by the time the next meeting rolls around. I, I can see us needing a, maybe another closed session midway, maybe like two weeks after the July meeting or a week after the July meeting. Um, and then maybe we can have our first session to be just kind of discussing the short list and then maybe a final decision, uh, you know, after, after July. Thank you. I think we could um, ask to collect availability so that we have an idea of what some options might be um, if the hoped for, if the hoped for applications that arise um, on, on a relatively expedited schedule. Other agenda items? Is there public comments on this agenda item, um, Mr. Joseph Pinero? I don't see any at this moment. Uh, I'd like to remind members of the public, uh, if you'd like to make a comment, please press the raised hand in your meeting window or press star nine uh, on the telephone. Looks like we do not have any public comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Joseph Panero. Um, are there further board comments? Mr. Thompson. Sorry, I meant to ask this previously. Um, at what, I mean, maybe it depends on what happens tomorrow, but can our next meeting be in person or at what point are we intending to have in-person meetings? Is that contemplated yet? Uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, Ms. Garcia, um, this may be, I'm not sure if this is something that you can answer, um, but um, is are there sort of state policies? Um, I know they're changing um, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, yeah, so, so the governor is reopening the economy tomorrow. I would just note, as Phil uh, alluded to earlier, there is a trailer bill going through the process right now, sorry, a budget trailer bill to make this uh, Bagley Keene a virtual meetings permanent, but if the board chooses, so that's just a tangent, but if the board chooses um, to do an in-person meeting, that is something we can assist with coordinating. And again, you'd have to determine, I get the location, Southern California, Northern California, um, and then date. Thank you. Um, so just to be sure that I understand, um, starting tomorrow, uh, nothing would prevent us from having an in-person meeting um, but we would still be able to meet this way. Um, nothing would prevent us from meeting this way either. Correct. Okay. And, and if I may, um, I, I would just advise, uh, depending on the location, that you double check that the uh, county where the meeting would be located um, doesn't have uh, more restrictive uh, standards in place. Um, but beyond that, uh, to, to Tiffany's point, um, 
uh, the executive order that allows for this alternative format uh, is continuing past tomorrow. Thank you. Um, my expectation, um, Mr. Thompson, would be that we would um, probably meet remotely at least one more time um, until we have a sense of location and sort of where we, where we can meet. Um, this uh, depends in part on um, what the subcommittee is able to uncover about location and options. And I think um, that is certainly something that, that we can ask about um, and that board members could also um, express any preferences that they have to Ms. Mirashidi um, with their, or constraints um, with their scheduling information. All right. Um, if there are no further agenda items or further comments, um, we have um, already covered uh, item number 14, future meeting schedule, because we took it out of order. Um, and we can move on to our final agenda item, which is number 15, adjournment. Um, I would like to thank everyone, the board members, um, our uh, panelists, and um, meeting council, Deputy Secretary Garcia, um, and Deputy General Counsel um, Philip Laird um, for their service to us today and for the um, many staff behind the scenes who've also made this meeting possible today, um, Mr. Joseph Pinero um, for um, moderating um, and for um, our um, person taking minutes, um, the person who set up the website um, and, um, and myriad other things so that we could meet today. Um, I really um, would like to reiterate my gratitude to the board um, for putting um, so much time and care into um, this initial meeting. I know it was a long one. I know we had a lot to discuss. Um, I know that we weren't able to discuss a lot of it in advance, which means um, that we um, had to probably spend more time on it than we would have otherwise. I greatly appreciate um, your attention and your dedication. Um, and I would also like to express my gratitude to the members of the public um, who have joined the meeting and who have contributed um, and look forward to their future um, contributions to the board's work. With that, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So move. Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, there has been a motion to adjourn the meeting and a second. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Joseph Pinero, would you please conduct the roll call vote? Certainly. Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Uh, Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. And Chairperson Urban? Aye. Uh, the motion to adjourn the meeting has passed with a vote of five yes, zero no, and no abstentions. The, this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>